My name is Scott, and I suffer from REM sleep behavior disorder. That, that's what the doctors tell me, anyway, because basically I act out my dreams during the REM cycle of sleep, which... If I'm having a lucid dream, means everything I experienced feels much more real. That that's my problem. I don't think it's just some disorder anymore. When I was younger, probably about 12 years old or so, my parents thought it was just me sleepwalking. We moved around a lot because of my dad's work as a construction manager. I guess they figured it was the stress of moving so often that caused it. But when we finally settled down and it didn't go away, my parents decided to seek professional help. So I never saw a problem with it personally. Never really felt like I was sleeping. It was more like, more like a meditation state. I was aware of my surroundings, but everything just felt a little off. I'd see things that other people couldn't. Fantastical, terrifying creatures that loomed in the dark. But despite my reassurance that there was nothing wrong, I still had to see a somnologist. The building looked brand new. It was small and looked to be freshly painted white. We had a welcoming atmosphere as we walked in with a receptionist desk at our left. Hello, how are you today? She asked when she noticed us. My dad responded, Doing well. We're here to see Dr. Castian for my son here. He patted me on the shoulder. They filled out some paperwork for me, and shortly after, I was called back to see them. Welcome, Scott. My name's Dr. Castian. I'm glad to see that you're looking well-rested, Dr. Castian said as I walked into his office. Hey, uh, my name's Scott. I was never great with social interaction. I mean, um, hello, Dr. Castian. Nice to meet you. He let out a short chuckle. It's all right. Please, have a seat. He gestured to a chair, sitting across from his desk. Now, I'd like to ask you a few questions before we get started. I already talked to your parents, but I'd like to get your version of everything as well. Before I prescribe you any medication, you know, that is. He had that wise old man feel about him, but only looked to be about in his mid-thirties or so. When did this all start? He asked when I finally sat down. About two, maybe two and a half years ago, I think. We finally settled down, and my parents figured it was just sleepwalking or something, I said with a hint of nervousness. Have you noticed a lessening of symptoms since you had settled down? Any new symptoms, perhaps? He asked inquisitively. Uh, no, not really. I mean, it just all feels real in the moment. I see things that don't quite make sense. I didn't hear about this from your parents, but it isn't uncommon. In the case that you are having a lucid dream, added movements of this potential condition could make your dreams feel that much more real. But you find yourself questioning reality? He was taking this conversation in a weird direction, but he was a doctor. Well, the dreams do feel real. Almost like I'm meditating, but with my eyes open. He wrote something down on a notepad. What type of things do you see? He seemed to be very interested. Ghosts? Um, creatures that I can't find anywhere online? Impossible entities I can't describe. He jotted something else down. Well, from what I'm gathering from you and your parents, I believe this should be a rather simple fix. I'm going to prescribe you some melatonin at a strength of 10 milligrams. It's typically only meant for adults. But based on the severity of your case, I believe it'll do you well. You won't be harmed. Talk to your parents if symptoms worsen or if nothing changes. Have a great day, Scott. He wrote something down on a sheet of paper and called my parents in as I walked out the door. The medicine only really seemed to affect my movement. I wouldn't sleepwalk anymore, however, that just meant the things I was seeing would come closer to me. They never touched me or anything, so I figured there it was, the best solution. But that was, of course, until recently. I never stopped seeing those things. And in fact, as I grew older, I could see more of them. They also drew closer every night. It wasn't significant enough to notice at first, but eventually, they began touching my arms, my legs, and my sleep. The feeling of their hands was surreal, like something that was never meant to be felt, as the cosmos itself turned into a living organism. Since it started, I had been waking up more exhausted. I felt there had to be a correlation, so I did the only thing I could think of. I decided to go see a somnologist. It wasn't the same one, but I had been seeing this one for the past few years. 
The building was a bit larger than the one I went to as a child. It was painted brown, had a much more open lounge room with comfortable brown leather chairs. Scott, I heard the receptionist say. You're back earlier than expected. I hope everything's going well. I think she noticed my bags, but didn't want to say anything. Yeah, I feel like a million bucks, I responded drowsily. Is Dr. Kent ready to see me? Yeah. You know where to go, she said before, going back to something on her computer. Hey, it's me. I try to sound as cheerful as possible to mask the exhaustion. Scott, please take a seat. He generously had a cheerful expression, but he sounded a bit more serious today. So you've been having trouble sleeping? He gestured to my face, which I took as him pointing out the bags. Y yeah, um, um, well, I'm not quite sure how to describe what's been going on. So generally, my sleep is like sleep paralysis, you know, you know how it goes. But lately, the figures have been touching my arms and legs, sometimes rubbing just over my heart as well. I, I know it's just a dream, but the feeling is so real. Please elaborate. He sounded more serious. I couldn't tell if he thought I was crazy or if he was just trying to figure out what was happening. Well, um, maybe not real so much as does unreal. Like, like the feeling feels real, but the sensation is indescribable. Also, I pulled up my long sleeve shirt. In my dream, one of them scraped a fingernail up my forearm. But I can see it. I got closer to show him. Have you gotten any animals as of late? He asked. And no, um, just my goldfish. There was a pause. Doc, I'm not saying that I think they're real, but is there any reason this could happen? I mean, maybe a reaction to the meds? Anything? No. Not a reaction to the meds, though. It may be that you're building a tolerance to them so you're not able to move in your sleep again, then your brain's coming up with reasons for the sensations that you're feeling in your sleep. Uh, I can up your dosage, if you believe that'll help, but... You're already pushing it with how much you're currently taking. Sure. It, it might, I guess. I wasn't entirely sure of my response, but you know, I had to try something. As night approached and I got ready for bed, I took what he had ended up recommending, which was basically just under what caused me permanent damage. As I slept, I saw them again. They were more than I had ever seen, all poking and prodding at me. At one point, one of the things that appeared to be an old woman grabbed my arm and began moving my fingers like she was inspecting them. The whole night, my adrenaline was pumping. I felt exhausted. My anxiety peaked when one of them, that I can't describe, stuck their head into my arm. And I lost all feeling in it until I woke up. I was drained. Physically, as well as something else I can't quite explain. Spiritually? I decided to do some research to see if anyone else had any similar experiences. Considering my arm was still a little numb, I wanted to get any and all answers I could. It eventually led to some forums about paranormal experiences, someone's retelling of their recurring sleep paralysis episodes that eventually started affecting them in real life had a lot of attention. Things like scratches that they couldn't have caused on their own, as well as some unexplainable bruises. Some people were talking about their personal experiences. One in particular caught my eye. Yeah, I have similar experiences. My doctor prescribed me some medication, but it just made them worse. The comment was a few months old, but I decided to try and get in contact with them. I first tried just replying to their comment. But after a few hours, I decided I should take more direct measures. I found their email through some questionable means and sent them one. It mostly was just a few questions about if they had found a way to deal with the dreams, if they had found a solution through therapy or anything like that. It was about eight hours later or so, just as I was getting ready for bed when I found a response. But it wasn't one I was expecting. Someone had responded to my comment. Hey, just thought you might want to know. I did some digging and apparently 
This guy was sent to a mental institution recently. A few days ago, he was found dead. They labeled it as a heart attack in his sleep. Hope you figure out whatever you need to, my guy. That was it. Just some stranger telling me the guy died. It, sure, it was sad, but it wasn't helpful at all. That, that's what I thought at first, anyway. But the longer I dwelled on it, the more everything made sense to me. He was on medication for some sort of sleep disorder because of whatever he saw in his sleep. He was eventually sent to a mental institution, and then, then he died in his sleep of a heart attack. Whatever the guy had, it must have been similar to what I've got. I mean, the scratches, the bruises, weird visions in his sleep. I began to worry that I may have something similar happen to me. I responded to the stranger. Hey, do you know anyone I might be able to talk to? What he's talking about feels awfully familiar, and I, I could use some help. Unfortunately, they never responded. So instead of taking my usual medications, I decided to do something I hadn't since I was a child. Or rather, I decided to not do something. I didn't take my medication. It took a little while to fall asleep, but eventually, it came to me. The things were much more handsy. They were, they were holding my entire body down while others gathered around. I couldn't move no matter what I tried. The sensation of their hands going into different limbs prevented any movement whatsoever. It was, it was an agonizingly long dream. I don't know if that's what I would call it. See, all their poking and prodding from that night was easily visible in the morning. There were even a few blood stains I noticed as I stumbled out of the bed. The numbness was it's unrelenting. So, I called in sick for work. I had to get everything situated. I, I couldn't go to sleep if I wanted to keep whatever was happening from happening. I continued to do some research and found a few pages that claimed things like keeping a crystal beside you as you slept. Typically some form of quartz or, or burning sage in the house would keep spirits away. And Well, I'm not certain that's what they were. I, I wanted to see if I could potentially do anything that could stop these things from touching me. So I went to a pawn shop that I knew I had seen some quartz at, and I, I bought some. And next, I went to a gardening shop. I picked up sage, a, a big bundle of it. And of course, I'd also picked up some salt from another store. I mean, it might have just been a bunch of hogwash, right? But... I wanted to take every possible precaution, so I had to pick up salt. That night, I was ready. I had a necklace with a cross, a piece of quartz to hold in my hand as I slept. I burned an entire bundle of sage, and I left a little a little burning in an ashtray next to my bed. Then I had made an entire salt circle where I could around my bed. You know, I, I thought I was prepared. That, that nothing could ever get near me. That they wouldn't be able to touch me again. That's what I thought, but boy, was I wrong. For the first few hours or so, they did actually keep their distance. I was able to sit up on account of the fact that I had not taken any of my meds in the past two days. But I didn't dare move out of the salt circles. I couldn't actually tell what was holding them back. But if it was the salt, I didn't want to take any chances. So I just sat there, turning my head to look at all the figures standing around me. By my count... It was probably around 15, but I couldn't be certain. They were all just standing just out of the reach of my bed. That was until one of them that I could feel the power of began walking to the front of the group. Somehow I could tell it was stronger than the rest, and as if I could subconsciously sense its aura and my brain was telling me to run away. A barrier... A weak barrier like this cannot hold me back. It was the first time I had heard one of them speak. Its voice was deep and gravelly with no noticeable accent, like a war vet who had seen their fair share of death and smoked a pack a day to deal with it. If you simply give your body to me, everything will be over with. You'll not have to deal with any more of us. Just then it grabbed my heart. The pain was immeasurable, like talons stabbing straight into my heart. One, two, three, 
My heart was still beating, but much slower than normal. Just give in, and your body will not have to die, boy. It sounded nervous, like it wasn't sure if what it was doing was right. One, two, three, still beating. Why? was all I could manage to get out. The reasoning is beyond you, boy. Now give it up! He screamed that last part in desperation. I suddenly remembered the crystal I had been holding onto in my hand, and I stabbed the thing in the arm with it. What happened appeared to be the crystal absorbing some of the energy from the thing's arm. It jolted its arm back and suddenly dissipated into nothing, and without saying a word, the other things followed its lead, leaving me in a blank room, something I hadn't seen in my dreams in so long. When I awoke, I had a slight pain where my heart was, but aside from some mild irritation, it appeared to be fine. I scheduled an appointment for an MRI, and I went to work. Everything was fine. I, I rarely see any creatures in my dreams anymore. But from time to time, sometimes in my dreams, sometimes in day-to-day -day life, I occasionally catch a glimpse of that thing out of the corner of my eye. But no matter how much I try to focus on it, I can never get a good look. On November 24th, 2005, there was a disturbing occurrence at Disneyland. It was an average day at the Wonderfield Amusement Park. Families were scattered throughout the park, the excited squeals of children rang out over the crowds, and Disney mascots wandered around and posed for photos. Suddenly, the magic of Disneyland was shattered as a frantic call rang out from the crowd. James? Where are you, James? James? A mother was running around Main Street, calling for her son. Other mothers pulled their children closer to them as the woman ran, her voice quickly growing from panic to horrible desperation. Tears began to roll down her face. Park security showed up and looked around. An announcement was made over the intercom to look for James, with the description of what he was wearing. The boy wasn't found, and nobody volunteered any information. It was only a few hours later but something else happened. Ronnie? Ronnie? Ronnie, where are you? Where's Ronnie? The same horrible scenario all over again. A mother ran around shouting for her son and asking people if they had seen him. She ran around with the boy's father chasing after her, begging her to calm down and trying to reassure her by telling her that they would find him. Another announcement was made for Ronnie. Nobody came forward with any information. After two kids had gone missing on the same day, something had to be done. Security in the park was tightened, placing security guards near almost every attraction in the park. Footage from surveillance cameras was reviewed, but nothing more than people buying sunglasses or Mickey Mouse walking around with a few kids. There was one security guard who reported that one kid had told him that he had seen Ronnie. The guard said that he was studying outside of one of the rides when a little boy walked up to him. The boy looked to me no more than six or seven years old. I know what happened to the boy, he told the guard. You do? The security guard didn't know what to think. The boy probably hadn't seen anything important, but it would probably be worth a listen. The boy nodded. I saw Ronnie. He was with Mickey Mouse, but Mickey was being mean to him. Mickey took Ronnie. Mickey, the guard said. He was confused. How could a child think that Mickey Mouse was taking the kids. The guard just assumed it was a kidnapper or something and knew that the kids would be found. Where did Mickey Mouse come into this? Yeah, Mickey ate Ronnie. He ate the other boy too. The guard was speechless. He was still trying to think of what to say when the boy's parents hurried over and pulled their child away, scolding him to be careful around the park and thanking the security guard for finding their son. As fast as the boy had appeared, 
he was gone. The security guard knew that he shouldn't have been too bothered about what the kid had said, yet he couldn't seem to push the thought of it out of his mind. The security guard waited till his shift was over, but instead of leaving, he went to the security room where a bunch of monitors displayed videos from the security cameras. He asked the people working there to review the footage and look for a Mickey Mouse around the time that James had gone missing. The tapes were rewound, and scenes from earlier that day were replayed on the monitors. The guard's eyes darted from one screen to the next until he finally noticed something. He told the men to pause the video. Everybody in the room focused on the monitor, even though there wasn't much to see. Mickey Mouse and a small child were walking towards a maintenance room door in what seemed to be Tomorrowland, near Space Mountain. The child seemed confused, maybe a little scared. The guard decided to check it out before he went home. He couldn't forget that one boy's solemn expression, or what he had said about Mickey Mouse. Just in case something happened, he took his radio and keys. The guard walked over to Tomorrowland, and he found himself by Space Mountain. There was a rusty maintenance room door off to the side of the attraction, nearly hidden behind a few trash cans. He pushed the trash cans to the side and tried to open the door only to find it was locked. The guard pulled out his keys and tried to find one to open it. Finally, he managed to get the door open with a maintenance key. Inside, it turned out the maintenance room led to an old maintenance tunnel. The lights were off. The guard tried the light switch next to the door, but the room remained in darkness. The vague echo of a rat scampering across the room was heard, but the guard could not see it. He hadn't thought to bring his flashlight. Suddenly, the guard gasped. His hand flew up to his nose. God, what was that horrible smell? He hoped the smell didn't get out so the guests could smell it. The guard assumed the maintenance tunnels went under Space Mountain. In front of him was a dark, inky blackness. He squinted and had to hope for his eyes to adjust to the dark. For now, though, he could make out vague silhouettes and shapes. He began to walk into the tunnel, visibility decreasing with every step. His steps echoed off the walls, seeming to pound on the concrete floor. The guard suddenly stopped walking a few feet away from a brick wall. He assumed he had just come to a turn. He looked left. He saw nothing. He looked right. He saw a small, flickering light. He decided to go towards the light. He kept his hand on the wall so he wouldn't get lost. The smell seemed to be growing. The smell seemed to be growing worse. After a short walk, he reached the light, which was actually coming from a small crack underneath a metal door. The door was rusted and bent, and the guard knew that it wouldn't take much to rip it from its hinges. The security guard found the doorknob and gently opened it. The door squeaked as it came open. The smell seemed to explode out of the room, eager to get out. The guard tried not to violently puke at the terrible aroma and looked inside of the brightly lit room. His eyes needed a moment to adjust to the sudden light. When they finally did, the guard gasped in horror. Children littered the room, almost all the ones that had gone missing in the park over the last couple of years. He recognized Sean. He recognized James and Ronnie. Lying on the ground with the other ones. They weren't just lying on the ground. The guard realized the children, they were, they were dead. He gasped again and took a step back. Some of the kids had arms and legs missing. Each one had their eyes removed, leaving bloody holes in their faces instead. Thick slices were over some of the bodies, as though something with claws had got to them. Something in the room moved. The guard tore his eyes away from the children on the floor and saw the most unrealistic thing staring at him. A giant Mickey Mouse stood in the room, observing the guard with wide eyes. And something was inside a Mickey costume. Everything came together in the guard's mind. It'd be easy for Mickey Mouse to lure the kids away, not to draw any attention. But now that, now that the same Mickey Mouse was staring at him, they had a silent staring contest for a few quiet moments, but then the costume's arms came up to point at the guard. 
A thick screech came from inside the mascot's head, and the mouse moved towards the guard. The security guard turned and ran for his life, the heavy footfalls of the costume behind him alerting him to the fact that the mouse was chasing him down the long, dark tunnel. The guard ran faster than he'd ever run before, just knowing that death was directly behind him, and close enough to stab him with its claws, close enough to wrap its arms around him and drag him back to that room. <gasps> and then the guard is outside. He stopped running. He blinked a few times to clear his vision. The sunlight felt warm and reassuring to him, but when he looked back at the maintenance room, he knew that the sunlight had stopped the thing in the costume. I mean, maybe that's... That was why it wore the costume to protect itself from the sunlight. But it wouldn't chase the guard anymore. He'd, he'd gotten away. The security guard reached back inside the maintenance room, groped for the doorknob so that he could slam the door shut and make sure the thing didn't get out. He expected to feel Mickey's hand seize at his, pull him in, but, but nothing ever happened. The guard slammed the door shut and sighed deeply. He was safe. The guard ran halfway across the park back to the security room. He told the other security guards that he had found something in the maintenance room, told them to follow him and take their guns, which were only to be used in a dire emergency. When asked to explain, he said he'd found the kids before he turned and began hurrying back to the maintenance tunnel. A large group of guards entered the tunnel and found the kids, scattered on the cold concrete floor. A blood-covered Mickey Mouse costume also lay on the ground in the room, right next to all those kids. So to say, he'd always be there. The guard was the only one to look back into the dark of the tunnel while the others were still looking at the kids. He was the only one to see the small pair of dark eyes in the tunnel blink once before vanishing into the darkness. Whatever it was, it wasn't human. He turned back towards the room and saw the blood smeared over the walls. The other guards were silent, all eyes fixated on it. It had been used to spell out a simple three-worded message on the wall. Still among you. The maintenance tunnel was destroyed. The door buried behind a concrete wall. Space Mountain was closed for a few days while it was searched and the security guard quit. To this day, the children still squeal in excitement and they hurry over when they see Mickey Mouse. Photo albums are being filled with pictures of the iconic mouse and nobody... Nobody ever knows for sure who's under the costume. Or... What's under it? For weeks, we had been watching her, usually while sipping a latte from the cafe window across the street from the park. She wasn't the only little girl he'd scouted since arriving in town, but she had been the most reliable, the most vulnerable, and those were traits that he always looked for in his targets. He had done his homework, and there were other boxes she'd checked off too. Name, Maria Hernandez, ethnic. Generic. Forgettable. Age. Seven. Eyes. Brown. Skin. Brown. Hair color. Black. She wouldn't garner nearly as much media attention as a little redhead named O'Malley, or blue-eyed pageant princess from the suburbs. Her parents were divorced, and from what he had managed to dig up, her father was pretty much absent from her life at this point, though he did live in the same city. Her mother worked till eight and was barely making ends meet. From after school until dinner, she was the responsibility of her teenage sister, who, from what he could tell, seemed more preoccupied watching the screen of her phone during their bi-weekly visits to the park than her younger sibling. It had all been so easy. Perhaps others might have flubbed things up, those who were too eager, too lazy, too sloppy. But for someone as careful as him... It had been like taking candy from a baby. Maria's sister had met some friends at the park that day, but they had only emboldened him. The older kids had been too caught up in trivial teenage drama to notice him slip out of the coffee shop and walk up to the little girl playing by herself on the swing. It didn't take much to convince her to hold his hand. A kind smile. A cheery voice. A little spanglish. Hola, Maria. I'm Tony. I'm a friend of your mother's. 
she asked me to take you home for her? They were cruising down the highway in his car before her sister even noticed she was gone. How long did he have before she was reported missing? A few hours, he estimated. The sister would probably waste time searching every nook and cranny of that park first. Might even wait for her mom to come home from work before she told her about what happened. The father would buy him even more time. He'd be the first person the police would check with, and it might take days to track him down. Deadbeat dads can be pretty crafty when it comes to ducking the cops, especially when they go years not paying child support. The sun was beginning to set by the time they got to his RV. He had it packed in a private lot across the street from a convenience store and hair salon where he'd been paying for the space and cash under a false alias. The RV wasn't some rickety old tin can held up by duct tape and string. It was sleek and modern, good condition, and capable of picking up and driving off at a moment's notice. It was the kind of camper well-to-do families rented for cross-country, summer road trips. Only once had he been forced to hitch his car up to the RV and make a run for it. But even then, it was due to his cautious nature. A long time ago, in a city on the other side of the country... He had made the mistake of setting up shop in an area full of nosy Nellies. It had rubbed him the wrong way, and he'd forced himself to abandon the mission even though he'd been jonesing pretty badly. A disaster he'd been careful not to repeat. Nobody would ask questions here, though. Streetwalkers and riffraff that slithered through those streets at night had no interest in who you were or what you were doing in their neighborhood so long as you kept to your own. How long had it been since he'd gotten his fix? A meticulous deliberation may have been a necessary precaution, but damned if they didn't make it a pain in the ass to get what he needed. He didn't want to go to prison, though. That would be a death sentence for someone like him, and he knew if he gave into his cravings too often, he would eventually slip up. It was best to suppress his urges and bounce around from town to town, leaving as small of a footprint as possible, even if it meant waiting years between girls. But his dry spells had been getting longer as of late. There were more ways to get noticed now than in the good old days, and the longer he waited, the harder it became for him to think straight. On the outside, he projected a cool, pleasant demeanor, but inside he burned with an almost insatiable yearning to act upon his urges. He had been closer than ever to give in to his impulses this time. If he had waited much longer, he might have lost control and the flame of desire would have consumed him. Just a day ago, it had taken all his willpower not to snatch a young girl he saw in the parking lot of a poppy's while her mother ran in to grab a cup of coffee. None of that mattered anymore, though. Maria was in his possession now. She was sitting on the couch inside his RV, and in just a few short moments his needs would be met, and he'd finally feel the release that he'd been building inside of him for so long. She was a pretty young thing. Finally, in the safety of his mobile sanctuary... He could appreciate her without worrying about catching stares from nearby adults, but he knew he couldn't let his eyes linger too long. He still had work to do. Just a minute, Maria, he said. His tone felt apathetic and friendly. I had to pick something up first. We'll go see your mommy in a little bit, but in the meantime, why don't you see what's on? The television was hooked up to a satellite on the roof of the RV and had far more stations than needed. He turned it on and began flipping aimlessly through the channels while the little girl stared solemn and quiet at the TV, and he wondered if she was beginning to sense the danger she was in. A familiar face on the screen brought him a surprise. For a brief second, he had seen a ghost, one that he hadn't thought of since he was Maria's age. Had it been a trick of the light or something his anxious mind had conjured up to mess with his nerves? He flipped back a couple of channels and realized... It had been neither of those things. The ghost had been real. An old TV show he had watched every day after school when he was a kid. It was called Billy Smiley's Cul-de-Sac, and now... Now he was looking at the show's star. The one and only Billy Smiley. Front and center on his television for the first time in almost 40 years. A wave of memories washed over him as he watched the bald man in a yellow cardigan and horned rimmed glasses strum his guitar in front of an audience of a dozen furry purple puppets. The show had been the lone, bright spot in his life when he was a child. His escape from the troubles he faced in school and at home. 
Good old Billy had been a band-aid back in the day. One he used to cover the wounds inflicted on him by a drug-addled mom and abusive father. Now Billy and the rest of his happy little cul-de-sac were back. They couldn't have asked for anything better to help usher him through his time of need. You ever see this show? He asked Maria with a smile. The little girl shook her head. Of course she hadn't. It must have gone off the air in the early 80s, and it wasn't as popular as the other shows on the kids' program's block at the time. It was a surprise to find it on in syndication at all. He placed the remote down at the end table, bolted to the wall beside the couch. Well, why don't you give it a watch? I'm going to run and grab something out of the back real quick, and, and then we'll go see your mom. He slinked off to the closet in the back of the RV, where he kept his special toys. He could hear the voice of Billy and the puppets ringing out through the speakers as he dug through the toolbox he kept hidden in the closet's secret compartments. His fingers were shaking. He was beginning to sweat and knew his nerves were a mess, but he was almost home free, so long as the little girl didn't mess things up for him, and all he had to do was keep her comfortable for a little while longer. He shot a look over his shoulder to check if Maria was still sitting on the couch. She hadn't moved. He let out a deep exhale. She wasn't going anywhere. Billy and his gang of puppets had a hypnotic hold over the little girl, and he marveled at how kid shows, even old ones, could still capture a child's attention so completely. Now remember, kids, even if an adult seems nice, said the gentle bald man on the TV, you should never get in the car with them unless you know who they are. One of the puppets, with beady black eyes and a bulbous blue nose, jumped up and started waving its paw. Mr. Smiley, Mr. Smiley, but what if Groupie is really, really hungry and the adult has candy? No, not even then, Billy said with a wave of his finger. Sometimes bad people pretend to be nice in order to get closer to you. If a stranger offers you candy and tells you to get in their car, find an adult that you know and trust, like a teacher or a neighbor, or a policeman, like Officer Oinker, and tell them what happened. The puppets all nodded their heads in agreement. <laughs> what are the odds? He chuckled to himself. Of all the episodes of Billy Smiley's cul-de-sac he could have tuned into, he had to happen across the one covering the topic of stranger danger. Was Maria picking anything up, or were Billy's lessons going in one ear and out the other? Didn't matter. It was too late for her anyway. The doors of the RV were locked, and he was the only one who could open them from the inside. He felt an electric charge run up his spine as his fingers brushed against what he'd been looking for. A hammer. He wrapped his hand around the handle, slow and deliberately, and then made his way back towards the little girl on the couch. On the television, Billy Smiley was still lecturing the puppets about the dangers of taking rides with people they didn't know. The time might come when a stranger does convince you to get in his car, continued the bald man in his friendly voice. And if that does happen, he might try to take you somewhere so far from your home, you won't know how to get back. Maria was sucked into the program. She didn't seem to notice him. That was for the best. He was squeezing the handle of the hammer so tight now that his veins were bulging from his forearm. The fire inside him has grown into a massive inferno, but soon he'd be able to extinguish it. With a swing of the hammer, he would douse the flames until they were nothing but a pile of smoldering embers. They'd rise up again eventually like a phoenix were born, but, but for a little while at least, he'd have some peace. The bald man on the TV narrowed his eyes and looked straight into the camera. Now if you find yourself frightened, listen carefully, Maria. His jaw went slack, and he almost dropped the hammer when he heard that. Maria? Had Billy Smiley just spoken directly to the little girl on his couch? The muscles in his neck tensed at the thought of it. No, it had to be the name of a puppet or something. Or maybe he hadn't heard anything at all. His nerves were, were getting the best of him, and his, his dry spell was causing him to lose it. And those flames were licking away at his brain, warping reality into some kind of bizarre fantasy land. Just swing the hammer. That's all he needed to do. Just swing the hammer. The fire will be gone and everything will make sense again. He took a deep breath to collect himself. Shot a glance at the little girl. She wasn't reacting as if she hadn't heard anything odd. 
Maria was staring at the TV the same way all kids do when they're engrossed in their shows. So he turned his attention back to Billy. If you're ever with a stranger and want to go home, all you have to do is cover your eyes just like this. Smiley cupped his hands over his face to demonstrate. Keep them peepers shut tight now. No peeking. And don't open them again, no matter what you hear, until you feel safe again. The puppets all covered their eyes with their furry little paws, just like Billy. What kind of advice was that? No wonder the show had been cancelled. There's no way television executives would let a show stay on the air if it was giving kids terrible tips like that. Whatever channel he had turned into must not have screened the episodes before they bought the rights to the show. He glanced back to Maria and found her covering her eyes with her hands, too. So she was scared. Knowing that alleviated his nerves a little. He didn't like losing control of a situation, and it was nice to be reminded that he was still the one in power. Oh my, Smiley said. He covered his eyes and stood up from his chair. The camera followed him as he stepped gingerly around the puppets and made his way over to a window. It looks like we have a visitor to the cul-de-sac. The camera cut to a shot of the window, and the sight on his TV caused his knees to buckle. He had seen the neighborhood on the show before as a kid, when every now and then Billy Smiley would greet different characters in the front yard of his home. It, it was always bright and sunny on the cul-de-sac. The cozy roundabout was always lined with nice little homes that had neat trim lawns, white picket fences, and pastel mailboxes. A, a slice of Americana he'd often fantasized about living in when he was young. But the children didn't tease him. His father didn't wake up on those nights that he'd down too much Jameson. There was something different about the cul-de-sac this time, though. Something wrong, something terrible. And the sight of it made his stomach rise in his throat. Parked on the street outside Billy Smiley's home was a large RV. It was too modern for any 80s TV show. Even, even worse, it was an RV he recognized. How could he not? It was the very same one he was standing in. His eyes darted over to Maria, who was still covering hers with her hands, then back to the RV on the television that looked exactly like his. No, no it didn't look like it. it. It was his. But how was it possible that he was looking at it on TV right now? Was it some kind of gag? Was he on some sort of new, fucked up version of To Catch a Predator? He watched the TV host's long, bony finger tap the window. Let's go out and greet the visitor, shall we? It couldn't be a new show. He was, he was positive that the man on his TV was no imposter. That was Billy Smiley. He was sure of it. But how could he look exactly the same after nearly 40 years? He rushed to the window, desperate to see the dim city streets, the streetwalkers, the drug dealers, anything that would allow him to regain his grip on reality. A homeless man, a stray dog, a deserted car, street light, an empty storefront, a trash fire, anything. But none of that was there when he cracked the shutters. Instead, he was met with sunrise, green grass, pastel mailboxes, and immaculate little homes with white picket fences. When he was a child, such a sight might have comforted him, but now only terror surged through his body. He didn't understand how or why he was there. There was no denying the fact that somehow he was parked on Billy Smiley's cul-de-sac. The door of one of the houses opened, and he couldn't believe his eyes as the man he used to watch on TV as a child strode out onto the front step and started down the walkway towards the RV. He slammed the shutters closed and then fumbled backwards, collapsing down onto the couch. The camera on the TV hadn't cut from the window's vantage point on the screen, and he could see Billy strolling towards him. Maria was still sitting quietly beside him, hands covering her face. Did you know about this? He asked her. No answer. Maria might as well have been a statue. But was she causing all this to happen? Maybe if I crack her skull open, it'll go away. Unless it isn't her doing this. Maybe it's the show, or a ghost, or something extra dimensional that I don't understand. But all he had was a hammer. And none of the other possibilities could have been fixed with a swing of it, so he stood up from the couch and raised his arm over his head. He would aim for the temple 
And if that didn't make the crazy end, then at least it might quell the flames that were, despite his new surroundings, still burning him up inside. If nothing else, he'd be able to think straight afterwards, maybe even figure out his next move. Three knocks at the door of his RV froze him dead in his tracks. He turned towards the TV where he could see Billy waiting for him to answer. The thin, bald man was rocking back and forth on his heels with his hands in his pockets and whistling to himself. He stood petrified as he watched, hammer still poised above his head, afraid to even breathe, lest Smiley hear him. Maybe then Billy would give up and go away. Maybe he'd let him go about his business like nothing happened if he simply didn't respond. His prayers would not be answered, though, and a few seconds later, a smooth, placid voice rose up from the other side of the door. How's it going, neighbor? I'd like to welcome you to the cul-de-sac. He racked his brain, trying to think of what to say in response. He was terrible at thinking on his feet. That's why he'd always been so thorough when it came to planning, but now... How was he supposed to plan for this? Go away! I'm... I'm sick! He dropped his head and buried his face in his hands. Was that the best he can come up with? Oh no, cooed the friendly voice. Why don't you come outside? I'll call you a doctor. Wouldn't want you to suffer after all. Another idea came to him. He could always try doing to Smiley what he was planning on doing to Maria. Couldn't be that hard, right? Just swing the door open, bring the hammer down on his bald head before the guy knew what hit him. She opened his mouth to reply, but when he looked back at the TV, only a small shriek came out. The puppets had collected outside the RV and were bouncing up and down while pawing at the walls. He leaned closer to the television to get a better look. They were bigger than before, maybe twice the size, and they moved like a pack of vicious, feral animals. He crept over to the window and opened the shutters just enough to peek through. The faces had chained as well. Gone was anything that could have once been considered cute. The little beady eyes were now wild and ravenous. Their noses hung off their faces like bulbous blue tumors in their mouths. Who are those? One of the creatures leapt towards the window he was watching from and snapped at him like a piranha with what looked to be a mouthful of needles. Hundreds upon hundreds of them, each as long as his middle finger. He fell backward on his ass and glanced up to see things slamming their paws against the glass so hard that he was sure it would break. He thought his mind might break too, but before he had a chance to register the insanity that was staring at him straight in his face, Smiley called out again and the puppets sloped away. Come outside if you're sick, neighbor. We wouldn't want you to pass that bug on anyone else in that lovely camper with you, would we? Of course, he knew about Maria. That had to be what this was about. Was Smiley aware of the other girls as well? Was this some sort of reckoning? But it wasn't his fault. He was burning up on the inside and those girls helped him heal. It was the only way to stop hearing his mother screeching in his head, the only way he could forget about what his father did to him, the only way to feel in control. Did Smiley know about that too? Why didn't he care about him and his pain? Maria still hadn't moved, and in that moment, he had the sudden urge to smash her face with the hammer. If he was going to go out, at least he was going to get what he came for. But no. There were more pressing issues now. He had to figure out how to get away from the cul-de-sac. There, there was no way that he'd be able to make a run for it. Those things outside would chase him down the second he stepped outside. And who knew what they'd do to him? If only there was a way to outrun them. Of course! He was in an RV. Why not drive away? How had he not thought of that before? His head had been so jumbled, his insides so on fire, he hadn't even considered the simplest out. Hell, he could start the engine and make roadkill out of those furry things as he sped off. Billy, too, if he was standing in the way. He had only taken a step or two towards the driver's seat when he felt the back of the RV suddenly drop. His eyes shut back to the TV in time to see the puppet things bouncing up and down around his rear tires. The purple bastards had taken out both wheels. They bounced their way to the other side of the RV and began swarming around the front tires. A moment later, he heard two loud pops, and the front of the vehicle sunk as well. From outside the RV, he could hear Smiley speaking again. Looks like you're having car trouble, neighbor. Come on outside. My pals can help you change your tires. The creatures began shrieking, and they sounded like birds being slaughtered. Was that laughter? Were they mocking him? The puppets, Smiley, and even Maria, who was still on the couch in her little see-no-evil monkey pose. Was this 
Some sort of game they were all playing with him? Please, he begged, just go away. He sprinted to the door and pressed his face up against it. I'm never coming out, you hear? Go away. Take those things you have with you and go. The shrieking subsided. And for a moment, there was only silence. He pressed his ear to the door, hoping against all hope that Smiley and the creatures would listen to his pleas and leave. And then that familiar, friendly voice spoke through the hush. But if you don't come out, then we'll have to come in, Smiley said. Only this time his voice wasn't gentle or placid. He rumbled with such authority that he could feel it on his bones. A thunderous bang resonated from the other side of the door, and he jumped back. A second later, there was another one, followed by two more. Did you really think the locks would keep us out? The voice was so loud, he checked his ears to see if they were bleeding. Something smashed against the side window, and he could see it through the shutters. The glass had cracked. Another bang on the door, and this time it began to buckle. The whole RV was shaking around him. We were just being polite, neighbor, because asking permission is the polite thing to do. But don't get it wrong. We weren't going to take no for an answer. The door buckled under another powerful blow, and two of the windows shattered, raining glass down on the floor. All that was keeping the creature out now was flimsy wood shutters, and they were about to give at any moment. You've been a bad boy, haven't you? said Billy. This time when he spoke, it was as if the entire world quaked. You've been a bad boy, and when you're a bad boy, you need to be punished. More windows blew open. The glass littered the floor of the RV. The shutters crumbled to pieces and fell to the ground, and he could see the creature's gnarled features peering back at him. There was no barricade between them now. They began to scurry in one by one, crawling like spiders across the ceiling and walls. A final powerful bang on the door caused it to crunch and fall off the hinges. Standing in the entrance now was Billy Smiley. There was nothing friendly about his smile anymore. It was twisted like the branch of an old willow, and it deformed his face into something deviant and perverted. The puppet things were slinking closer. Most of them had filed inside by now, and he caught a glimpse of Maria out of the corner of his eye. That made a break for her. Maybe he could take her hostage and negotiate his way out of this mess. Maybe, maybe if he could reach her, he could get back some of the control that Billy and the other things had taken away from him. He sprung towards her, but the creatures were faster. Two of them caught up to him before he could even get to the sofa, wrestled him to the ground, and sunk their needle teeth into his leg. He screamed, both in terror and agony, as they began dragging him towards the door, where the strange, bald man with a twisted smile was waiting. He swung at one with his hammer, but it smacked it away with its paw, then bit down on his arm sinking its teeth so deep into it he could feel the muscles tearing. Help, he shouted. Help, Maria, help! The young girl didn't respond, though. Instead, she continued to sit quietly and unmoving, her hands covering her eyes, just like Billy said. She wouldn't peek. Not even while he screamed her name, when the things began gnawing on his entrails, she wouldn't peek. Not when they started chewing the lips off his face and biting out his tongue. She wouldn't even peek when Billy doused what was left of his body in gasoline and burned it down to nothing but a pile of smoky ashes in the middle of the street. She wouldn't peek. Not even just a little. I didn't even know I had an older brother until he showed up outside my school that afternoon. It was two years ago. I was a sophomore. My little sister Paige was a freshman. The original plan that day was to hitch a ride to a friend's house, where we'd probably team up and knock out our homework as quickly as possible. The plan changed when we exited the building and someone called my name. Parker! Hey, Parker! My attention was immediately grabbed. I glanced around for anyone familiar. All I saw was a guy in his late twenties leaning against a fancy car parked in the street. He smiled and waved me over. Parker, over here! Double checking to make sure there was no more Parkers in the immediate range, I decided to at least meander over. Paige was practically clinging to my backpack as we walked over. She was a little shy and I was expecting any second for this stranger to look away and find that other mystery Parker. But he didn't. He lit up and looked right into my eyes as he walked up to him. Wow, Parker. 
You're going to get taller than me, aren't you? I frowned and made sure to take a side step in front of Paige just to put myself between the stranger and my sister. Can I help you? I asked. He looked a bit sad for a moment before he sighed and nodded. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't remember me. You're only two, and Paige here. He stood on tiptoe to look at Paige. She was just a little baby. I must have looked super confused because Paul reached for his wallet and pulled out a photograph. I'm Paul. I'm your brother. He said, handing me the photo. It, it was so... jarring. There was my mom and dad. I was standing in front of dad with a big old smile on my little toddler face. Mom was holding Paige. And there was a boy standing between my parents, about 13 or 14 years old, with the same blonde hair that both me and Paige had, and a grin on his freckled face. I'd never seen this photo before, but it was real, and in my face, and impossible to deny. I looked back up at Paul, who was back to smiling. His freckles had faded away with age. His teeth were straighter and whiter, but he still had the same goofy smile, and I could just about tell that we had the same shape of our eyes, the same ears that stick out just a bit. But the resemblance was uncanny. Paul reached out and clapped his hand on my shoulder. We have a lot to talk about. Come on, you like McDonald's? Paige cleared her throat. We should probably just go home. Mom and Dad, they're going to be at work until, what, five, six? Paul glanced over my shoulder and looked at my, well, our apprehensive little sister. If they're still the workaholics I remember, they'll not be home for hours. We'll only be a bit. I just want to catch up. Oh, bye. I, I should have known better. So should have Paige. But even if we did... We still got into the backseat of Paul's car, and he drove us to the McDonald's a few blocks away. Lunch that day had been pretty garbage, so getting a McDonald's treat was more than welcome. Paige tried to decline, saying that she wasn't that hungry, but he offered her an Oreo flurry, and like magic, her appetite came back. As we sat in a booth, I stopped inhaling my burger for a moment to confront that elephant in the room. Why didn't Mom and Dad ever tell us about you? Paul was not at all surprised by the question, but he answered with one of his own. You're a good kid, aren't you? Always home on time, straight A's, chores done without a single complaint. Uh, I mean, I have a B in algebra. I stopped myself before I nodded. I guess so. Paul glanced over at Paige. You too? He said. Paige also nodded, and Paul sighed, nodding of understanding. Yeah, that's about right. Nothing wrong with that, but I was a bit more... Uh, high maintenance. I pushed my fries away, and I leaned forward to listen. Paige, despite her apprehension, was looking with just as much interest as I was. I guess you could say I had issues. I mean, I was 14, but... I was already getting myself into heaps of trouble. Paul drummed his fingers on the table. My grades were awful. Got into fist fights at school. I'd snuck out at night. I mean, once I got out of there, I figured out I wasn't like most kids. But one day, Mom and Dad just sent me away. Paige gasped quietly, her eyes going wide. They sent you away? Where? She asked. Uh, Tennessee. Friend of Dad lived down there. They took a weekend trip and dropped me off at the door with a suitcase and a note. Paul shrugged. I don't blame him. I mean, I was a uh, holy terror. But man, it does sting a bit that they never even mentioned me to you guys. I'm still family. Or at least, at least I thought I was. A wave of sadness and disgust washed over me. Sad that I'd never gotten to know about Paul. Disgust that our parents just gave up on him like that. Most 14-year-olds go through phases of being difficult, right? It sounded like he just needed some therapy, some freaking support, and our parents just made him someone else's problem and erased him from our lives. Paige finally lowered her defenses, 
reaching across the table and resting her hand on his. I'm sorry, Paul, she said. Paul smiled, reaching across the table to ruffle her hair. Not your fault. Not yours either, Parker. You were just babies, after all. But hey, I'm here now. Let's make up for lost time. Don't waste food. But if you want anything else, let me know. And feel free to ask me literally anything you want. I got nothing to hide. I didn't want anything else, but Paige did get an order of chicken nuggets. We munched, got to know each other, and got to know our older brother. After Paul left the house he was dumped at, he had traveled all over the states. He didn't want to go home without showing he was worth something, he said. He worked all sorts of jobs, waiter, mechanic, janitor, but it was his most recent job as a manager at a small store that he ran into his girlfriend. Well, girlfriend. Do you guys know what a sugar mama is? Paige nearly choked as Paul handed us his phone. A picture of himself and a woman that was probably in her early 60s. Sure, she was pretty okay looking for her age, but damn, she was without a doubt older than our mother. That's Elaine, he said, pointing at the woman. Elaine lost her husband a few years before we met, you know, lung cancer, and she just wants some company. Specifically, she wants a cute company. He poked himself on the cheek, and I happen to be adorable. I couldn't stop from laughing as I picked up the phone to get a better look. Dude, our parents would kill you, I said. Listen, in life, you're up to your ears in debt until you die. You start off rich or you marry into a good life. I mean, uh, Elaine and I aren't married, he laughed at the thought of that. But I could do whatever I want, and, and she wouldn't care. As long as I'm home every night and then and ready for some snuggles. He gave a pointed look at Paige, who scowled at the innuendo, but I just cracked up. True to his word, Paul did get us home before our parents. But once we all got out of the car, he tossed the keys to me. Registration's in the glove box. She's paid off and only a few hundred miles on her. You have your driver's license, right? I was too stunned to do anything but nod. Then you're set. Think of it as a present for all the birthdays I missed. See you soon, guys. With that, Paul just walked off in the direction of the nearest bus stop. Of course, our parents had quite a few questions when they came home, and all of them revolved around the car in the driveway that was easily worth over 50 grand. I just waited for them to get all their questions out at once before I looked at Paige, who crossed her arms and said what needed to be said. Paul came to visit. Their faces were enough to confirm once and for all that Paul was our brother. Mom's face went white and Dad staggered back falling into his armchair to probably avoid fainting. Mom took a seat on the couch, taking several deep breaths. He found us? She asked. Found us? I repeated, that earlier disgust starting to boil up into rage. We moved after... My mom swallowed. You're all right? He didn't hurt you? Hurt us? I snapped. Are you kidding me? Why did you never tell us about him? He's our brother! My dad cleared his throat. The half-brother, actually. He stared at our mother, who just looked at her hands. And you need to tell him to take the car back. When he comes back, give him back the damn car. I scoffed. No way! You can't afford to give me a car. If you want it gone, I'll just sell it and save the money for college, I said. Why didn't you ever mention Paul? Mom's head was bowed in shame. Paige Parker. Paul's not right. I didn't want to hear it. I just stormed out of the room. Paige right behind me. We had heard all we needed to. Our parents abandoned a kid just because he wasn't good enough. And Paul was actually not so bad now. At least, we thought so, anyway. Paul showed up again the next day at school. Not at home. This time, he took us to his condo, which was just as nice as you'd expect from a man who'd just given away a luxury car. We had a Skype call with his girlfriend, and Elaine really was nice, if not a little eccentric. If you're Paul's family, you're mine, she laughed quietly. So if you need anything, and I mean anything, just call me. I'll help you however I can. After the call, we ordered pizza and just spent the whole afternoon chilling out, playing video games, getting to know each other, and just getting to know Paul. He was competitive, but never a bad winner, just giving tips about how we could improve. He gifted Paige a brand new laptop, perfect for homework and for playing video games. I'll get you your own car when you get your license, he promised. 
ruffling her hair and then asking what movie we wanted to watch. When Paul dropped us off late that night, he didn't come into the house, but he did wave at our parents waiting at our front porch. My mom just looked ready to die of embarrassment while my dad... I guess he looked so stern to hide any fear that he had. We didn't talk to him. We just went inside to go do our homework. It went like that for a few weeks. Mom and Dad would tell us to stop hanging out with Paul, but since he was always outside school at the end of the day, we just hopped in his car and took off for another fun afternoon. Mini golf, arcades, wherever we wanted to go, he'd just plug it into his GPS and we'd spend an afternoon having fun. We even spent a whole Saturday at Six Flags. Paul had us take an overpriced picture and put it in an even more overpriced frame as a souvenir. I got a t-shirt, Paige got a stuffed animal that was almost as big as she was. And meanwhile, our parents were clearly upset, but we barely talked to them. I had resolved that I hated them both for cutting Paul out of our lives, and I was going to do the same to them when I turned 18. Like, God, the fact that they moved after they left him to be someone else's problems so we couldn't find them? It pissed me off. Page 2. Her theory was that Dad had given up on him so quick because Paul's not his kid. It was so tense at home I wanted to spend even more time with Paul, so just to, just to escape all that. And one of the final things we did was go out to a movie. But then we were all best friends, Paul, Paige, and I. We had so many expensive gifts, so many fun memories. We weren't even a little bit afraid of him. We'd gotten all the snacks that we could carry from the concession stand and settled into our seats when a handful of popcorn smacked into the back of my head. I turned around and intentionally groaned to see some unfathomably familiar faces. Paul glanced over to see the popcorn sticking out of my hair. What the... More popcorn flew through the air, followed by some pointed snickering and loud whispers. Ignore them, I said, pinching the bridge of my nose. They're just some jerks from school. Paul's eyes widened. You're getting bullied? He asked quietly. I wouldn't call it that. Especially since Evan is the principal's son. I glanced back at the group and glared at the middle one, who only proceeded to laugh and throw more popcorn. But they mess with me sometimes. It's fine. They just get bored sooner or later. I got in a thicker skin from this sort of thing. I was already one of the tallest of my class, but I was also the quiet guy who didn't stick up for himself, so... I was an easy target. Paul turned around, and I swear, it was the first time I saw that carefully placed mask on his face slip. The look in his eyes screamed murder. Fuck off! He growled at the group behind us. Evan mockingly, Ooh, what you gonna do? He asked, smirking like he knew he was untouchable. Paul responded by getting up starting to walk back the few rows where Evan and his goon squad were sitting. I don't know what they saw, but I think Evan realized that Paul wasn't going to just sit and take it like I was. He threw up his hands and repeatedly whispered apologies. Paul stopped at their row and leaned in close to the boys that looked ready to shit themselves. He whispered something I didn't hear, and I think Evan did actually piss his pants a little. Paul straightened up. I heard him mutter, enjoy the movie. And then, he returned to his seat. Back to being fun Big Brother Paul, just like that. At least I wasn't getting popcorn thrown at my head anymore, so I brushed aside any concerns I had. That night when Paul dropped us off, he didn't stick around long. He said he needed to call Elaine. She had left him a voicemail earlier about how much she missed him, and frankly, that's all I wanted to hear. You know. This time, my parents were waiting in the living room together. They'd been going at it like cats and dogs for a few weeks now, constantly having whispered arguments. I think my mom was sleeping on the couch. Your mother has something she wants to say. Dad said. Mom just stared at her shoes for several painfully long moments before Dad added, Or I'll say it, and I won't be as nice. Paige scowled. What? You need to know the truth about Paul, so please sit down, Mom said. Her voice barely above a mutter. I did take a seat across from them, but I probably looked as interested as I did during algebra. What? Mom looked like a woman defeated. L like your father said, Paul is your half-brother. But that's not the whole story. She swallowed before she sat up straight and finally told us the whole story. I met him at camp. I was a counselor. 
Your father and I were on a break. She glared at him while he just quietly scoffed. After he cheated on me with his tutor at college. So, I was bitter. I was alone. I was empty. But Paul's father, he was charming. Different, but charming. After camp that year, I realized I was pregnant. Paul's father, we... We, we couldn't be together, so... I just went back to your father, and I let him think that Paul was his until Paul was born, anyway. It was impossible to hide that. Dad shuddered. You gave birth to a monster, Andrea. What the hell is wrong with you? Paige blurted out. Just because he's not yours? I wasn't being metaphorical. Dad glowered at Mom, who seemed incredibly focused on the wall rather than any of us. Tell them, Andrea. Mom's eyes welled up. Paul was born a few weeks early, and he came out so fast we didn't even have time to pack up for the hospital, and when he did, he... he... he wasn't right. I, I can't even describe it. It's something you'd have to see to understand. Paul looks fine to me, I said. Because he wants you to see him like that. Mom rubbed the back of her neck. He can do that. Within minutes, he looked like every newborn baby boy. I would have blamed it all on the pain and hysteria if your dad hadn't seen it too. And sometimes he looks like that again. If it was only me in the room. Paige and I probably looked equally confused. Mom, you're not making any sense, she said. I, I know. Mom nodded before she looked at me. The scar on your stomach, Parker. Shaped like a triangle, is it still there? I hauled my shirt up to show it off. It had faded over the years, but it was still visible. From the time I fell, I said. That's not how you got it. Mom shook. For the first time in weeks, I stopped being angry at her and was now genuinely worried. Pa Paul was... He was mostly like any other child until you two came along. He was... He was a good boy. But he changed. He changed and I was... Afraid. Terrified. To leave him alone with you. The one time I did... Oh my god, I can't. I can't. Mom broke down in tears. Burying her face in her hands. Dad finally interjected. He was acting up beforehand, but your mom was taking a nap in the room over. I came home from work early and I found Paul in your room. You were just lying there, eyes glazed over, and he had his mouth on you. I nearly threw up. What? I had to have him repeat it. I thought he was just being a sicko, and I ripped him off, but it... Parker, you were bleeding real bad. Dad shook his head. You only started crying when his teeth were out of you. I looked at the scar again. My head was swimming. I couldn't breathe. He bit me? I asked. He was trying to eat you. When my dad started to shake, it was with pure rage. I nearly lost it. He wasn't even sorry, Parker. He was just mad I interrupted his snack. Paige looked so white, she, she looked ready to faint. That doesn't look like a bite mark, she managed to get out. He bit him with his real mouth. My dad managed to get himself back under control after a deep breath. But you've all been seeing, it's not really Paul. He's not human because his father wasn't. I couldn't let him be in this house anymore. I began doing research and I found someone. I thought you shipped him off to a friend. Not exactly. Dad finally looked a little ashamed. I found out more about Paul and what he could be, and I found someone who could handle him, teach him to get his hunger under control, but Paul ran away from them after a few months. We'd already moved, but I didn't sleep through the night for years because I was afraid he'd be back to finish what he started. I leaned forward, trying to wrap my head around this. How is he not human? I shook my head. That, this can't be real. It is real. My mom sat back up, wiping away some of her tears. I never wanted to give Paul up, but he... He would have killed one or both of you. We didn't have a choice. 
After the room stopped swimming, I got up. I need to be alone. I went into my room and I laid in bed for hours just staring at the ceiling. I knew what I had to do, but I had to wait for everyone in the house to be asleep, even Paige. Even if she was part of this, I had to do this on my own. My alarm read 12, 13 when I finally got up. If my parents heard me start the car, they they would have been out of bed before I was zipping down the road towards Paul's apartment. I probably broke the speed limit, but I didn't want to wait. If my parents were telling a lie, I needed to let Paul know they'd lost their frickin' minds. Paul's apartment lights were on, and by then I knew where he kept the spare key, so I let myself inside. He was quiet, but I figured that he'd just drifted off to sleep on the couch while binging Netflix. He wasn't on the couch, though. I walked through the apartment, trying to hear him snoring or something. As I pressed further into the apartment, I... I didn't hear snoring. I heard this wet, squishy sound, like, like someone was wading through knee-deep molasses, and it only got louder as I headed for the spare bedroom. You used it for storage, he told us. So I never bothered to check it out. The door was... It was cracked just an inch, and despite my better instincts, I pushed it open. God, what I saw, I still can't believe, even though it's been years. I, I can't believe it. I barely recognized the two corpses hanging by their ankles from the ceiling. Both were stripped of their clothes, completely drained of blood, and their torsos ripped open. Their bodies empty, except for some bits of flesh and bone. The third body was still twitching a bit, and still had some color in the face, but still took a second for me to place him as Evan. I'd never seen Evan so blank. There was nothing going on behind those empty eyes, and the thing next to him... I, did, I don't even want to describe it. It was humanoid, but barely so. It had two legs, but only one arm. It, its gut stretched out so far it looked ready to topple over. The skin was baggy and all mottled blue and green, and its arm was shrunken, curled in towards its body like a claw. Its head was pressed up against Evan's gut, teeth set into his skin as it continued to suck blood and then whatever else fluids it could get. I saw its sharp tongue stab into his gut and Evan gasped before his eyes rolled back and shut. His body caved in like the monster was draining a Capri Sun, liquefied guts spilling into the creature's mouth and even some dripping down his chin. It, it finally pulled off when Evan was hollowed out. It turned in my direction. His triangular mouth filled with rows and rows of spines that never seemed to end. Its tiny eyes blinked so did I. And, and then there was Paul, standing in front of me, looking entirely normal except for being soaked head to toe in blood. Parker, he said, so softly, sounding so surprised. It jerked me out of my shock. I slammed the door and ran for it. I barely got to the living room before the back of my shirt was grabbed, sending me flying onto my ass. Parker, damn it, wait a second. I looked up, expecting to see that thing instead of my brother, but it was Paul, out of breath and looking like a genuine serial killer. Christ, you know how hard it is to run just after you had a meal? I thought I was going to die. I wanted to beg for my life, remind him that he was my brother, that he didn't have to hurt me, but I, I didn't have to say any of those things. Paul crouched down next to me, brushing his red-stained hand against my cheek. I flinched, something he didn't miss, judging by the hurt in his eyes. I wanted to tell you, but then there's just so much more to explain, and I just, I just didn't know where to start. I, I just wanted to say sorry for what I almost did to you as a kid, so I figured, why not give you something, something to show I didn't want to hurt you. I swallowed telling my legs to crawl backward and away from this blood-soaked maniac, but I couldn't move. I was, I was frozen. What are you? I asked. My father's child. A son of Bellavan. Paul shook his head, tears welling up in his eyes that looked just like mine. I'm so sorry, Parker. Back then I was so... so hungry all the time and I just I couldn't stop myself I, I couldn't and those those dickwads in there 
The world's better with a few bullies gone from it, and this way, I won't lash out at someone else. Someone like you and Paige. I shook my head. You, you killed them. I glanced at that room where the three classmates were still hanging like meat in a freezer. You just killed them. I did. Paul nodded. And I think I saw what my father saw so many years ago, the apathy for human life. I did, and I did it for you. I finally ran. I finally got my stupid legs moving, and I fled that apartment, and Paul didn't try to stop me. When I got home, my parents were waiting for me on the front porch. I hadn't brought my cell phone. It's stupid, I know. But they thought that I'd gotten myself killed. I just hid in my room. I didn't tell them I was sorry. That they were right all along. I didn't think I needed to. Since then, my parents have divorced. I stay with mom most of the time. Paige stays with our dad. We don't see each other, except at school or during holidays, and we sneak away from our respective guardians. It's rough. Yeah, but we get by. I've never told her entirely what I saw that night, only that our parents were right all along and that we needed to stay the hell away from Paul. I sold the car. Paige gave away the laptop. One by one, we got rid of his gifts. Paul's just gone. <laughs> After Evan and two of his friends were reported missing, his apartment was vacated. He left without a word or a goodbye. The bodies were never found. I don't know if Paul just ate the rest or dumped them somewhere where they can't be found. I, I don't know. The nightmares from that night never... Never ending. The image of Evan just hanging there, letting Paul drain the life out of him without a fight flash before my eyes. And needless to say, I'm a bit of an insomniac. Why does this all come up now? Well, because... Because I got a welcome letter for a job I never applied for. Alongside the letter is that picture we took at Six Flags. Got the words, I'm waiting for you, written on the back. It wasn't signed, but I have a feeling. I have a feeling who applied me for and who's the one waiting there. So I'll be accepting the position. Next summer, it looks like I'm going to be a counselor. Camp Golden Oak. It was Nora who told us about the secret beach. She had heard about it from a bartender when she'd been up late at the resort bar, and once she mentioned it to the rest of us, we all knew we had to go and see it for ourselves. The directions the bartender had given her weren't great, but according to them, the beach was a couple miles away. According to them, it was a cove, just off the beaten path. They said the water was crystal clear there, and the fish liked it because there was never any people around. Supposedly, it was a great place for snorkeling amongst the untouched natural beauty of Mexico, and that was all we needed to hear to sell us on it. Mexico was meant to be a retreat, a temporary escape from the world, so we could recharge and come back refreshed. It was the first time I'd ever left Canada, and it was supposed to be magical. We were going to have the time of our lives. For the most part. We had. I didn't grow up with a lot of money, but Katarina and Nora didn't want to go without me. So they paid for almost everything. My plane ticket, my stay at the resort, and even some of the activities we did together. I couldn't put into words just how grateful I was for what they'd done. Nora's always been a kind soul, though, and although Katarina can have a bit of a temper, she's still one of the most generous people I know. Still, they went above and beyond for me, and I made an effort to get out of my shell more for their sake. I couldn't pretend as if I didn't enjoy myself either. By far, I'd say I had more fun in Mexico than I ever had in my entire life, and I was determined to relish every single moment of that trip. We headed for the second beach, close to sunset. We had a busy day before then, having left the resort to drive around Cancun. The secret beach was our plan for dinner. We'd picked up the supplies there to grill some burgers on the beach and brought our snorkeling gear and bathing suits. We'd been talking about doing a bonfire, too, if we could. And after all, it was going to be there to stop us. 
We parked the car in a nearby walking trail that we knew ran close to the beach. The beach itself was down a slight incline, a bit off the beaten path, but it wasn't that hard to get to. I did remember seeing a sign that I'm pretty sure read no swimming, but we figured that was just because there was no lifeguard. I mean, why would there be? Between the six of us, it didn't take long to get all of our things down to the beach and get set up. The water was crystal clear, as promised, and the pinkish horizon rising above the ocean was a breathtaking sight to see. It's an image that I never will forget. Nora had gone off to change into her swimsuit almost as soon as we'd set everything up. She looked absolutely gorgeous in the twilight. She was already beautiful enough so that I'd caught myself envying her look more than once. Her long, platinum blonde hair was cast out behind her in the wind, and her black, one-piece swimsuit accented every part of her perfectly. I remember watching her sit down on the beach and smile into the sunset, taking in the sight as if they were made just for her. Another one of our friends, Izzy, sat nearby, almost oblivious to her. His eyes were also trained on the horizon, and he furiously scribbled in his sketchbook in a desperate attempt to immortalize this moment forever. But I suppose that was typical of him. Izzy had probably spent more time sketching Mexico than he had actually enjoying it. Although this time, nobody really cared to stop him. Behind me, Katarina and Joseph set up the grill for later. Or, more accurately, Joseph set it up and Katarina supervised. She's always been what some people might describe as the mom friend. She was never aggressive, but she was fussy sometimes. And I'll admit, it was a bit funny watching her and Joseph bicker like an old married couple. As for Joseph himself, what could I say about him? He was smart, kind, handsome, funny. Some small, childish part of me actually envied the fact that it was Katerina talking to him and not me. From the corner of my eye, I caught Nora grinning at him as I stared at him. She didn't need to say a word. She never did. Instead, she just scooted over to me and playfully fanned me with her sun hat. What are you doing? I asked. Cooling you down. You look like you've got the hots, she teased. Oh, enough. You know, the longing gazes are cute and all, but you know you can always just talk to him, right? Hey, Joseph, want to grab drinks sometime? Why, yes, spending time with you would be so lovely. She was nice enough to keep her voice low, but I swatted her away anyway. She just giggled. Don't be mean. I'm just teasing. But seriously, talk to him. What's the worst that could happen? I don't know. Maybe later, okay? Later. Sure. She knew I was full of it, and gave me a playful nudge. You know, not to gossip, but take a look over Izzy's way. She tilted her head in his direction. Sure enough, I noticed that someone else had joined Izzy and was looking over his shoulder as he sketched. Penelope wasn't someone I knew super well. She was closer with Nora and Katerina than she was with me, although she had a boldness to her that I couldn't help but admire. She was still wearing the cutoff overalls she'd been wearing earlier that day, although with a bright orange floral shirt, and she had pulled off the look wonderfully. Her wavy dark hair had streaks of colorful dye in it. She wore an ever-present smile that was almost impossible to resist. Some days I really wished I had her confidence. I had a feeling she was going to shoot her shot today, Nora said. Looks to me like it's going well for her. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Well... We are on a nice romantic beach with nobody around, so... Okay, okay. Maybe I'll talk to him later. A wry smile crossed Nora's lips. Well, if you're gonna sit here, wanna hear a joke? Oh god. I knew where this was going. No. Okay, so this family of four walks into a talent agent's office and says, We've got an act you're going to love. Stop it. So the talent agent says... I don't do family acts, they're too cutesy, but the family is really cute and wholesome, and the dad's kind of begging him, so he decides to give it a shot. Nora, hold on, hold on. So the mom takes out some glasses and lays them in front of the kids, and the kids take out spoons and start playing a cute little song, and the dad hums and drums a little beat, and mom does backing vocals, and then the daughter starts to sing, and it's a really pretty song. She's got this beautiful voice like a classically trained singer. Stop! Then, the mom and dad start to dance, and the son and daughter serenade them. It's really entertaining, it's entrancing. The agent just looks on in awe, and the son switches instruments to the violin, adding more depth to the song, and at the end, the agent is in tears. So he says, that's beautiful, 
What do you call it? And the mom and dad smile and proudly say, All right, all right, I'm going. I got up to escape her dumb joke and change into my swimsuit. We call it the motherfucking shit fest serenade for... Nora called out after me with a shit-eating grin, and I just groaned before going over to Joseph. He looked over when Nora called out her so-proud punchline after me and managed a sheepish smile. She did that joke, didn't she? He asked. It was tamer than usual, I replied. So, uh, how's the grill coming? I don't know. Katarina? You're in my light, she replied with a faux frustration. I think we're good, though. There's enough ice in the cooler to keep the maid good for another few hours, too, so we can relax for a bit before we eat. Nice. Well, we've still got some daylight, so who's up for a swim? As he spoke, he pulled off his shirt, and I may or may not have caught myself blushing a little. Kate? Cat? You in? Uh, yeah, give me a sec, Katarina said. You two go on ahead. I caught her giving me a not-so-subtle wink. Thank God Joseph didn't notice it. All right, come on. He grabbed a snorkel mask off the stand and tossed it to me before grabbing one for himself. It was an invitation I couldn't really say no to. I was wearing my bathing suit under my clothes, and I shed them along the beach as I followed Joseph into the water. The temperature was nothing short of perfect. I looked back to see Katarina picking up clothes off the sand for safekeeping before going to sit down beside Nora. Penelope and Izzy were still whispering to each other and looking down into his sketchbook. For a moment, everything seemed nothing short of perfect. Joseph and I were out there in the water for a good hour or so. The bartender had been right. You didn't need to swim out far to see the colorful schools of fish swimming along the untouched reef. In the pinkish light from the setting sun, the world beneath the waves was cast into a beautiful golden glow. The fish kept their distance from us as they went about their business, almost ignorant to us as we swam above them. I stayed by Joseph's side the entire time, only servicing to marvel at the sights below us. I caught Katarina and Nora swimming nearby as well, deliberately keeping their distance from us. I knew their game, and honestly, I kind of appreciated it. I even saw Penelope out with us, although Izzy stayed on the beach, his nose constantly in a sketchbook. The sky grew darker and darker until it faded into the bluish color that preceded nightfall. Looking at the shore again, I noticed that Katarina and Penelope had made their way back to the shore and were standing over the grill. I didn't see any trace of Izzy, and I figured he'd probably just decided to see what the water was like before it got too dark to swim. I could see Penelope in the water nearby, but not, not him. I didn't think too heavily on it, though. Guys, burgers are on, I heard Katarina call. Come on back. Before me, Joseph raised his head out of the water and lifted his mask off. He glanced back at the horizon almost reluctantly before looking back at me. Come on, we should go. I'm getting kind of hungry, he admitted before diving back in and heading for the shore. I hung back for a moment and looked around for Nora. I spotted her a few feet away from me, lazily floating around on her back. Nora, I called. She raised a hand to wave at me. You coming? Wait a minute. Just relaxing, she said. Go ahead, I'll be right behind you. Famous last words, I teased as I swam over to her. I splashed water on her face and she squirmed before splashing me back. Fine, fine. Hold your fucking horses, why don't you? She kicked her legs and started back towards the beach. I could see Katarina standing over the smoking grill, although I didn't see any signs of Penelope. I swam for the shore following Nora back. I had to admit, all that swimming had worked up a bit of an appetite. By the time I made it back to shore, Katarina had noticed Penelope's absence and stepped away from the grill to call for her and Izzy. What's wrong? I asked Joseph as Nora and I got out of the water. I don't know. Penelope and Izzy took off, he said. Jesus, they couldn't wait until after we ate, Nora asked. They probably just dipped out for a bit of one-on-one -on -one time. Right before we eat? I asked. Maybe that was something Penelope might do, but Izzy? Not by a long shot. They can't be far, Katarina said. Now can you guys just help me look? Joseph, can you keep an eye on the food? Yeah, sure thing, he said before going to check on the grill. Nora frowned before stepping away from me. Izzy, she called. Penelope, get your asses out here! She wandered a little further down the beach, calling out for them as she did. A weak sense of unease began to churn in my stomach. I was used to the anxious feeling. I'd, I'd felt it so many times before. Usually, 
it was that illogical fear of the worst possible situation that went away as soon as everything turned out alright, which it always did. But while it was there, it was hell. Izzy! Penelope! I heard Katerina call. Come on, guys! I looked down the beach in the other direction. Watching the sand for footprints, it was impossible to tell which footprints belonged to who in the rapidly approaching night. The moon had risen to shine over the glimmering surface of the water like a midnight sun. It was the only light save for the glow from the grill. Izzy! Penelope! Katerina's last call was cut off abruptly, and I heard her scream. I turned around to see Joseph and Nora both staring in the direction where she'd been standing just a moment before. Now, though, there was nothing. Just a small cloud of disturbed sand starting to settle. Cat? Nora asked, but there was no answer. Joseph stared at the settling sand, ignoring the burgers as they burn. Cat? Nora asked again, but she didn't move a muscle. What happened to her? I asked. I... I... I don't know. Joseph, did you see anything? No. I just heard her scream and... J Jesus, did, did something grab her? Nora didn't reply. She just stared at the patch of sand where Katerina had probably been standing. I couldn't see her face, but I knew she was putting things together. Kate? Joe, we need to get off the beach. What about Kat? What... Uh, what about Izzy and Penelope? Joseph asked. I said off the beach now! Move! None of us moved. Instead, we just watched the sand beneath our feet. I could see Nora scanning the area around her, looking for something, anything out of place. I caught myself doing the exact same thing. I could see our, our previous footprints in the sand. And I could see where Izzy had been sitting before. And now that I was looking, I could see where... He'd stood up, and where his footprints had suddenly ended. The sand looked a little disturbed there, nothing too obvious, nothing that any of us would have looked for, but it was... It was obvious enough. Guys, I called out to the others, let's just retrace our steps, alright? Step where we've already stepped. Maybe that's safe. I could see Nora thinking it over before slowly starting to make her way back towards us. She treaded lightly, following her own footsteps back and getting closer and closer. She moved slowly, but at least she made progress as she made it back to the grill. The burgers were burning and the smell of charcoal filled the air. Joseph watched her intently as she closed the distance between him and then looked at me. Kate, just stay where you are, she said. All right, we'll come to you. Let's travel together. What if something grabs one of us? Like it grabbed Cat, Joseph demanded. What if it grabs all of us? Well, what do you want to do? Scatter and get grabbed? Nora snapped. Just hold your fucking horses and walk to Kate. I could see Joseph considering arguing, but he kept his mouth shut. He went first with Nora right behind him, retracing our steps back towards the incline that we'd used to get down the beach. Joseph kept glancing at the tree line, gauging the distance between him and it. It's just a few steps away, I heard him say. Come on, we can make it. Joseph, don't, Nora warned. Just stay on the path. It's right there. I mean, come on. We, we can make it. Kate, Kate, head for the incline. We'll meet you up there. Joseph, don't. I can make it. It's right there. Joseph, no. But he wasn't listening. I mean, I understand. He was, he was scared. We were all scared. He wanted off the beach just as much as any of us. He was just... Impatient. Nora grabbed him and stopped him from making a dash towards the tree line. Maybe he would have had an easier time getting up that way than he would have if we'd gone back the way we'd came. I mean, maybe. Although he never lived to find out. The sand to his right seemed to shift. I know that Joseph saw it and he stumbled over as he tried to evade it. I saw a pair of spider-like segmented legs emerge from the sand as something smooth and solid lifted itself out of the beach. A crushing claw shot outwards, closing around Joseph faster than he could react. He barely had time to scream before he was violently dragged under whatever had surfaced beside him. In the blink of an eye, he was gone. A small cloud of sediment had been kicked up when the dormant crustacean had risen, but it settled quickly leaving nothing but a trail of footprints in the sand 
to indicate that Joseph had ever been there. I could see Nora watching in wide-eyed horror, frozen and unable to move. I could see her body trembling in fear. I half expected her to start running too, but no. When she next moved, it was slow and deliberate as before. I could hear her heavy breathing and her frightened sobs. I could see her body shaking as she drew nearer to me. As she approached me, she crashed into my arms, hugging me close. Kate, she gasped. Oh God, Kate. It's okay. It's okay, I lied. It's gonna be okay, we'll just... We're almost home. I held her by the hand, trying to hold back my own tears. In the moonlight, it was hard to see the path we'd come in by, but we took it slow. I never thought we'd reach the incline. I never thought that we'd make it back off the beach, but somehow we did. I made Nora go first, pushing up to what we hoped was safety. She reached a hand down to pull me up after that, and after that, we couldn't have gotten to the car fast enough. We left the keys down by the beach. I, I don't know what happened to them or if anyone got them back. Instead, we spent most of the night by the side of the road, hoping to God that a passing car might pick us up. And I considered us lucky that when one did the next morning, it was another tourist like us who was nice enough to try and help. We spoke to the police. But as far as I know, they did nothing. Our friend's death were labeled as mysterious disappearances, and neither me nor Nora have known exactly what to say or do about that. We, we haven't fought it. I mean, what's the point? What exactly could we tell the families of Izzy, Penelope, Caitlin, and Joseph? Would they ever believe the truth if we told them? So, so I suppose that mysterious disappearance will have to suffice, but I can't go through life without telling the truth somewhere at least once. I miss my friends. I miss them every day. I know that Nora misses them too. I wish they were still here. I wish we'd never found that stupid beach. But you can't change the past. And I know I, I should consider myself lucky that I didn't meet the same fate as they did. But it's hard to count yourself lucky. when you're one of the ones that got away. It started because I was doing a fluff piece on the new East Wing opening at the Habitsville Hospital. A hospital is a busy place, and the nurse who was showing me around the new area was quickly pulling away to more important matters. I was left to wander, a little red notebook in hand, jotting down details about the added infrastructure. And then I heard it. The familiar titter of low voices talking quickly and quietly. The distinct sounds of little-known and scandalous information being shared. Being the investigative reporter that I am, my ears pricked at the prospect of a story. The speakers were two doctors, both looking stressed in their white lab coats. They were both holding clipboards in their hands with papers full of numbers I didn't have the education to understand. I just don't know what's happening, one said. The other looked down at the chart. Unexplained paralysis, blood stoppages and appendages, renal failure, heart failure. She shook her head. I've never seen anything like this. They had a solemn pause. Then the first doctor spoke. What are we telling the families? The other sighed. Just say we're doing everything we can. Then she straightened up and cleared her throat. I'm going to go check on them. See if there's any more tests we can run. The two split ways. The other doctor moving in the opposite direction, but the other walking towards me. I quickly averted my eyes, so she didn't suspect my eavesdropping. But when she moved past me, I turned to follow her. She moved fast, like all the doctors I'd seen on those cheesy medical dramas. I kept up, walking at a safe distance behind until she reached her destination, the farthest collection of hospital rooms within the new east wing. There was a large desk in the center of the semicircle, but no one was sitting at it. In fact, there seemed to be no other employees in the vicinity at all, so I stopped following the doctor so she wouldn't hear my footsteps accompanying hers. At first I thought it was just another empty area, same as all the others in the new section of the hospital, but then 
Then as the sound of the doctor's feet grew distant and disappeared, I took my first tentative steps forward. And I saw them. Every room had an occupant. The doctor had said she was checking on them, so I could only assume that she had stopped in one of the rooms. The awkwardness of getting caught was tempting me to turn back, but there was something else, something stronger that made me stay. As I peeked into each room, I could see them. Citizens of Habitsville, laying in hospital beds, completely still. No, not just still, no. It was as though they were frozen. An old woman, a middle-aged man, even a little girl. I watched each of them for a minute and a time, and none of them so much as blinked. Their faces were gaunt, fixed in a permanent look of vacancy. I could hear a strange sound, a soft whistling coming from most of the rooms, and it took me a moment to realize what it was. The strenuous sound of someone trying to breathe without their chest rising and falling. I leaned into one of the last rooms in the semicircle and immediately pulled back. The doctor was in there, adjusting the medical equipment around the bed of a woman. I, I didn't think she saw me, but immediately cursed myself when I heard her speak. Hello? I entertained the idea of fleeing the scene, but instead walked into the doorframe. Hi, I'm, uh... She glanced at the visitor sticker I wore on my collar. You here to see Michelle? She asked, motioning to the woman who was lying in bed. I hesitated. Uh... Uh, y yes I haven't seen you around but she had said that she had a nephew we both looked at the woman ashen and frozen in the bed I mean when she could still the doctor said awkwardly then trailed off she looked at me and gave me a tired smile I'll give you two a minute alone and then she left I looked out the door to see the doctor make her way out to the large desk in the center of the area. It would be incredibly suspicious if I immediately walked back out of the hospital room, so I supposed I was indeed going to have a moment alone with Michelle. She was different than the others. When she was dressed in the same drab hospital gown, her blonde hair sat flat and lifeless against her head, and her face had that same frozen, vacant expression, but I quickly saw something that made my heart jump in my chest. Her eyes were following me. While the others couldn't so much as blink, Michelle was staring at me intently. It seemed insensitive to be scared, but my hands grew slick with sweat and my pulse quickened. It was like looking into the eyes of a deer that had just been hit by a car. Hi, I said nervously, but of course she didn't answer. Her eyes were flickering, moving from needing mind is something to the right. What is it? I asked, knowing that it was useless. Her lips were glued shut like the others, though her chest still rose for each breath with obvious effort. Then I saw her hand. Her arms were stuck at her side, but I could see the tiniest bit of movement in her fingertips. It was motioning clumsily somewhere on the other side of the bed. Cautiously, with another quick glance out of the room to make sure the doctor was still at the desk, I made my way to the other side of her bed. My anxiety waned slightly as I saw it was something completely... ordinary. Her handbag. You need your purse? I asked slightly. I asked, slightly embarrassed at my nervousness. I picked it up and brought it over to her. Her hand moved faster in a beckoning motion. D you want me to get you something out of it? She blinked more rapidly and moved her hand faster, which I took as a yes. I opened the purse. Inside was all the normal things. Y you need your wallet? She didn't blink. L lipstick? Again, no blink. A hairbrush? Nothing. There was a keychain attached to a small picture of Michelle, looking much healthier and... and a grinning little girl. Still, this elicited no response. Then I saw it. It was a small vial, almost like a test tube. I thought it might be some kind of medication, and I considered calling the doctor in, or a nurse. And then I saw the label. It was a plain piece of masking tape, stuck to the glass on the outside. In large block letters, drawn on with a shaky hand was a single unexpected word. 
fox breath. I pulled it out of her purse and turned it over in my hands. The contents were strange. It looked like dirt, chalky reddish brown. It fell grain by grain as I turned it. My eyes transfixed. It took me a moment to realize that Michelle was now blinking very fast at me, faster than she had at any previous time. I tried to hand it to her, and her fingers moved in a circle. In a message, I took to mean unscrew the cap. I did so, peering with one eye into the opening. I had no idea what this ill woman wanted with a bottle of dirt. But as her pretend nephew, I wasn't going to deny her. She twitched her finger more, so I brought the vial close to it. Slowly, painstakingly, her breathing growing more ragged and labored, she stuck her pointer finger into the bottle and curled it, then brought out a small collection of the dust. With great effort, she flipped it onto her palm, then went in and did the same thing again. Now there was a small mountain of the stuff in the center of her hand. She stopped moving. Then the a, a low sort of growl coming from within her now stuck closed mouth, her arm bent at the elbow with a great amount of strength and pain, she was able to lift her hand to her face. I thought for a moment that she might eat the dust, which would have been bizarre, but she froze. Catching her breath, her lungs had begun to make the same whistle sound the others had, the strange hum that resonated in the east wing. But then, with, with the smallest movement, she beckoned me closer. I hesitated. Her eyes were watering from the effort it took to move even that small amount, but there was something more within them. It would seem she was unable to move her facial muscles, even her eyebrows. There was something intensely pleading in the way she was looking at me. So, unable to say no, I leaned forward. Still staring at me, her eyeballs frozen in their sockets, I heard something strange. The whistling of her breathing had changed, growing strangely deeper. A great, hollow sound that almost made me back away. Almost. And then... In a sharp, high-pitched gust, she blew air out of her nose as hard as she could, coating my face in the strange dirt in her hand. I immediately fell backward, coughing and sputtering. My mouth tasted of salt and chalk, and my eyes were s stinging and clouded. What the, what's, what the... I started to say, but I still didn't want to attract the doctor's suspicion, so I fell silent. I rubbed my eyes, staring at the floor. And once they cleared, I turned back to Michelle to ask her questions that I knew she couldn't answer. But when I looked at the woman in the hospital bed, I found... I found her drastically changed. I blinked trying to see if the dust had simply messed up my vision, but there was no mistaking it. Though the top half of her face remained as I previously saw it, everything else was disturbingly different. From her mouth down, her skin was a strange reddish brown, not like any human skin I'd ever seen. But the color wasn't the worst part of it. The texture was what caused me to violently recoil. I could see that her chest and neck had a sort of shine to it, glistening under the harsh fluorescence as though the skin was permanently wet. The lower half of her right arm was the same, slick and horrific, bits of it smearing on the blanket that covered her lower half. I could only imagine what her legs looked like. But the top half of her right arm, her left arm, and the lower half of her face were different from the rest. They were lighter in color and lacked the shine. Of course, they seemed incredibly hard and dry. I could see that there was even cracks in her skin around her elbow where she had raised her arm to blow the dust into my face. I backed away slightly. I was, I was going insane, clearly. This woman was insane, or, or murderous, or mad from illness, and she made me inhale some sort of powdered drug that made me hallucinate. Right? Michelle was still staring at me, her ordinary skin peeking above the rest like a masquerade mask. Her eyes held in line with that same pleading expression, but this time I had no idea what she wanted, what she expected me to do about her plight. And then, then something worse happened. Her breath caught in her chest and rattled there. What's wrong? I asked quickly, but of course she couldn't answer. As I watched in horror, the skin of her chest changed. Though it was glistening and wet before, it began to... to... dry. Michelle was 
slightly coughing now, wheezing through her nose, her mouth still stuck as her chest hardened. She seemed to grow even more in distress, thrashing with what little movement her body would allow. I, I moved to her bedside, tried to loosen the collar of her gown, but then immediately had to pull my hand back in pain. Her chest, which was growing more and more dried and dusty, had become white hot to the touch. I was panicking now. Uh, I'm getting the doctor, I said, then felt a tight pressure on my wrist. Michelle still moist right hand was gripping tightly on my flesh, the slick wet texture of her touch sending a shiver down my spine. Her, her strange fingertips left marks of reddish brown on my skin, the, the top half of her face turning now, the, the color shifting to the same as the dust in the vial, which was still clasped firmly in my hand. Her eyes traveled to it, then back to mine, that same yearning in her face. I could feel her hand hardening around my wrist and, and watched as the same happened to the rest of her, her chest and face. She wasn't blinking anymore, her eyes murky with a substance that had become her body. As her grip hardened and dried, I felt another surge of pain. It was growing hot. Same as her chest, it, it quickly grew past warm to un uncomfortable to actually burning my skin. I tried to yank my arm away as my flesh baked and blistered, but Michelle didn't loosen her fingers. I shut my eyes. I, I pulled as hard as I could. I tentatively opened them. My heart dropped into my stomach. Michelle had shattered. A pile of dusty rubble sitting in her hollow hospital gown. I distantly heard the ringing of the flatlining left quickly as doctors came rushing in. I moved past the rest of the rooms in the East Wing, looking in as I had the first time, but now I could, I could, I could see them. Clay figure after clay figure, each hardened into rigid castings. I left the hospital, one hand wrapped tightly around the vial that read Fox Breath, the other still bleeding and burning from the touch of the dead woman's grasp. I walked around town. It, it's something I always do when I've I've seen something I wish I hadn't, something terrifying and confusing and impossible. I craved the feeling of fresh air after watching Michelle suffocate before she... She... Well, disintegrated is the best way I could describe it. I, I had so many questions. Why couldn't the doctors see what was going on? The cruel creeping of the clay, the strange, intense heat of it. Why, why couldn't I at first until Michelle blew the dust into my eyes? I kept walking, my fist still closed around the fox breath vial. My feet continued to wander as my mind did, and by the time I looked up, I was in an unfamiliar part of Habitsville. It was one of the many dusty back streets in town. The few buildings boarded up in dark, the streetlights flickering in, in the coming dusk. I took one step back to turn around and head home. When I saw it, Fox breath. Pottery. It, it couldn't have just been a coincidence. I stared at it for a moment, making sure I hadn't imagined the faded text on the aged sign. It was a small building. A small building tucked between the abandoned ones, but still, it stood out. It was a faint light dancing in the clouded window. I walked closer, creeping carefully, till I was near the window. I didn't dare approach the door. The glass was coated in red dust. It was difficult to see through, but at the bottom, near the worn sill, I found a gap in the layer of dirt, and I was able to see inside. There was an old man inside, and for a moment I feared he too had the same ailment as the people I had seen in the hospital. Then I realized his hands were only covered with wet red clay, and his fingers still moved with ease, unhardened. I could, I could see his face, only the glint of his wired glasses and the hunch of his back. He was seated at a long wooden table on which there were a few objects, a large square wrapped in cheesecloth, a bit of wet clay visible through the fabric, tools, dainty scrapers and cutting wire all coated in red dust. And, and then there were the figurines. A few were painted. They were glossy, sturdy, finished products. And then there were the unpainted. The unfinished. A man. An old woman. A little girl. In the sculptor's hand, a paintbrush dipped in gold, giving the freshly fired figure in front of him 
her blonde hair by the light of an open kiln. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I just wanted to tell you about one quick thing. Richard Saxon, the author of tonight's story, has a fantastic new book that's going to be available on Amazon very, very soon. The book is called From the Depths, Terrifying Tales by Richard Saxon, and you can find a link to it in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. Ground Control, do you read me? A voice buzzed over the radio. I leaned forward in my chair, studying the signal received from our station in geostationary orbit. As I turned my microphone back on, I briefly admired the fact that the message was coming from over 35,000 kilometers away, from a little metal box hanging in space, as it slowly orbited the Earth. I hear you loud and clear, Holloway. Good to have you back, I responded with an overwhelming relief, filling my voice. The astronauts aboard the GSSS had been out of contact for the better part of an hour. Whether it was due to some kind of interference or technical problems remained to be answered, but it alone had put us all on edge, considering anything in geostationary orbit has an orbital period equal to the Earth's rotation. In layman's terms, it means that the station never strayed out of reach relative to our position on Earth. Yeah, hey, what happened out there? We lost contact for a moment, I asked. The rest of the crew on ground control sat in silence. Each of the scientists listened on our conversation. I felt relieved, but something about Holloway's voice sounded so urgent, almost scared. We found something, he began. Not exactly sure what, but it's what cut us off. We just lost signal. We found something. Could you be more specific? I could do you one better. I'm uploading the missing footage as we speak, Holloway said. The GSSS had remained under constant supervision since its launch in early 2012. It was a covert mission meant both to study human endurance in space and to track foreign bodies entering Earth's orbit. Within a few minutes, the missing video and a few photos had been uploaded to the server. While the footage itself mostly showed the inside of the station and the astronauts gathered at one of the few windows, as they tried to figure out what had happened, I was more interested in the pictures. They opened up the first one displaying it on the control room's main screen. It was pointed outward from the Earth into deep space, filled with a starry sky that one couldn't dream to observe from Earth itself, but in the center of the photo lingered a black patch of nothingness, as if a part of the picture had failed to receive any sort of light exposure. Uh, Holloway, what am I looking at? I held my breath as I waited for a response, but I'd never seen anything quite so empty. I felt like I was staring into a black hole, but that obviously couldn't have been the case, as it would have annihilated the station within a split second. We, we don't know. Just hung there, approximately 25 meters away from our station as we passed. We couldn't get any reading on it. No radiation, no movement, no force. Nothing. According to our instruments, it doesn't even exist. Can you still see it? I yeah. asked. No, we passed it 47 minutes ago. Just regained contact. It appeared to be locked in its orbital path. Doesn't make any sense. But following this trajectory, we'll see it again in just over 23 hours. We'll send more data then. The next day was spent by the office, analyzing the little information that we'd received from the crew aboard the GSSS. But with only a picture and limited readings claiming the black spot in space didn't exist, you could do little except wait. Yet none of us ventured home for some much-needed shut-eye. Instead, we waited at the office, as a thousand different theories formed in the back of our minds. And then around the same time the following day, we lost contact with the crew. By then, we already knew what was going on. While it was a worrisome phenomenon, we knew that it wouldn't even last an hour. And sure enough, as the day before, it was a temporary problem. Ground Control, we have a problem. Do you copy? A voice called through the radio. At first, I didn't recognize the voice. Holloway was the man in charge of the station, so to speak. But whatever reason, someone else had taken it upon themselves to contact us. This is Ground Control. Who, who am I speaking to? I asked, not able to recognize the voice due to the interference. It's Matthew. 
we've passed by the hole again. It's bigger. We only missed it by a few meters. Next time we pass it, we'll hit it. Uh, all right, Matthews. Uh, we have to change the station's altitude immediately. Then we need to speak to Holloway. We locked him inside the sleeping quarters. He lost it. L lost it? What, what happened? He kept staring outside the window as we passed the hole. Then he just... He went unresponsive. By the time we figured out what had happened, he'd already sabotaged the CMGs. We, we're drifting. Can... Can you repair it? That's all I could think to say. I don't think so. We'll need to... Wait. How the hell did Halloway get out? Stop it! The message was cut off abruptly. Matthews, are you there? Matthews! I periodically screamed into the radio. We desperately scrambled to regain any contact, but no matter what we did, the GSSS remained dark. Hours passed, with the station heading for direct collision with the strange cosmic phenomenon, and even if the crew were still alive up there, we hadn't the faintest clue what would happen when they finally crashed. By the time another day had passed, most of us had gone upwards of 70 hours without sleep. Some had collapsed on their desk, and every available crew member had been called in. But it wouldn't help. But exactly 27 minutes before impact, we received the last transmission we'd ever get from the crew aboard the station. This is what we heard. Ground Control, this is Matthews. The comms were sabotaged after Halloway escaped. We've lost him alongside Garcia. We had to kill them. They, d they didn't leave us any choice. We spent the past day trying to shift course to no avail. I, I don't even know if I can get the radio up and running for long enough to send this message. In about 15 minutes, we'll lose contact as we get within reach of the hole. Then we'll collide. I, I don't know what will happen once we do, but I doubt any of us will ever get to see Earth again. He paused for a moment, his, his breath turning erratic as it became obvious just how scared he was. Don't forget our names once we're gone. Frank Matthews. Melissa Cameron. David Rikers. Henry Jenkins. We're about to venture into an unknown world. Tell our families we're sorry that we couldn't make it home. Tell them that Kyle Holloway and Gabriel Garcia died as heroes. What happened wasn't their fault. I wish we had more time. Goodbye. With that final transmission, contact was once again lost. As well as any visuals we had on the station. It had entered the dark rift in space, and as we pointed our telescopes at its supposed location, we could see it grow in real time, slowly expanding across the night sky. While it was too little to be seen unless told where to point, we estimated that merely a year would pass before it could be seen through a hobby telescope. Within two, it would be visible with the naked eye. We mourned the astronauts that would never be mentioned in any kind of news outlet. Their mission to expand the scope of mankind had been secret, so their deaths would go unnoticed by all but those who loved them. I thought it odd that such is the destiny of the most of mankind. As death finally grips us, we're all too quickly forgotten. Even the heroes, the greatest minds and the most famous stars will eventually be washed away by time itself to the great unknown of the universe. We're all equally expendable. Once we'd scanned the sky for any trace of debris that might have originated from the station, we finally realized that it hadn't just been destroyed, but swallowed up the dark rift. It didn't matter where we looked or what kind of probes we sent out to search for the dead crew. 
they were erased from our part of the galaxy. But in the wake of their demise, something more sinister lurked in the back of our minds. What would happen as the rift grew? And would it ever reach Earth? At first, there was little we could do except observe until a probe could be sent out. A, a job that on its own would take the better part of a year, even with an exceptional amount of funding. Of course, getting money was an easier task when a planet-ending catastrophe would annihilate us within the decade. Six months we spent observing as the rift was growing exponentially in size. What had started off as a pothole-sized rift had grown as large as a house. We recalculated, estimating that within five years, it would expand enough to consume Earth. Then one night, as I was packing up my things, dreaming of a bottle of whiskey, which I'd, I'd need to aid me to sleep through another panic night, I got an alert blaring from my computer. It was already late, leaving little more than a skeleton crew at the base, meaning I'd have to stay behind to deal with whatever minor error it probably was. I walked back to my computer, dropping my things, as I realized what had just been detected. It was the GSSS emerging from the rift and moving towards us. The signal was weak, but unmistakably belonging to the station. I, I grabbed the radio and attempted to make contact. This is ground control. Does anyone copy? I called out in excitement, knowing fully well that even had the crew survived the initial disappearance, they would have long since starved to death as they were just a week away from the next supply delivery by the time they went missing. Is there anyone there? I repeated. To no response. With that, an emergency was declared, calling all available personnel to work. According to the signal we'd received from the CPODs, there was no sign of life aboard the station. So we initiated a station-wide, forced download of all footage, all data, everything we could get our hands on before the station hit our atmosphere and burned up. People were running around screaming orders at each other as petrobytes of corrupted data loaded itself onto our hard drives. We were frantically trying to find a way to redirect the station so that it would, it would burn up completely in the atmosphere and not rain down as debris on innocent people, but it was as futile of a task as we still hadn't calculated its exact trajectory. But in spite of our best efforts, the station had gone dark. Even with the limited contact that we had, any ability to maneuver once there had been disabled. Either by outside forces or by internal sabotage. All we could do was watch as it disintegrated over the west coast of Mexico, landing 13 miles off the shore into the ocean. While it was not an event easily visible by the public, no one knew the nature of the incoming debris. Even had they seen it. We scrambled to send out a crew to pick up what little salvageable junk we could find, hoping to at least find traces of the dead astronauts. And while the salvage teams were on the task, we set out to repair the downloaded footage. In terms of observation, the GSSS stood unmatched. Every inch of the station was monitored 24 hours a day. With the limited exception of lavatories, we had an eye on the astronauts all the time, not only with visuals and audio, but the system's functionings. Usually, it was a semi-live feed, but in times without contact, the data was quickly downloaded, which meant we already had everything up until the moment they were swallowed by the hole. After the fact, there was less information. The first few hours of footage remained intact, so the office gathered around to observe it, none daring to speak a word as we got our first looks into what could only be described as a completely new world. A picture came to view, taking place during the last moments of our conversation. Can you repair it? I heard myself ask over the radio. Matthews was standing there, his face glued to the various panels used to control the CMGs. I don't think so. We'll need to... Wait, how the hell did Halloway get out? Stop it! Alloy had managed to break out and had torn the comms apart. Based on the limited view that we could get of him in the footage, he looked emotionless, empty. Stay the fuck back, Garcia yelled as he held up a wrench. Floating around in zero gravity made fighting a different kind of challenge. 
but a proper swing could still significantly injure anyone unfortunate enough to be a recipient. Garcia and Matthews grabbed onto Holloway and brought him back into the sleeping quarters, where they tied him up. And all the while, he never spoke a single word. He just kept staring at the windows. What happened to you? Matthews asked with no response. We gotta fix the comms, Garcia chimed in. Cameron and Riker were already hard at work trying to repair the CMGs, while Jenkins was attempting to piece together what remained of the communication station. The gyroscopes are more important. If the hole keeps growing, we'll hit it during our next orbit, Matthews says. Stay with Commander Holloway. I'll check on the others. Matthews exited the sleeping quarters while Garcia sat with Holloway. Come on, you have to talk to us. Why did you sabotage the station? Holloway still refused to respond. He just kept staring out the window. Did you see something in the hole? Garcia asked. This time Holloway turned his direction back to Garcia, finally acknowledging that he'd heard the question. He appeared to be whispering something, but it couldn't be heard over the audio channels. What was that? He asked as he bent closer. Holloway then whispered something inaudible to Garcia, who instantly shook back in a shock. The concern, the fear, that had been visible on his face only moments before, had been washed away and replaced by a bizarre sense of apathy. He bent down to untie Holloway without speaking a word. The two of them both looked hollowed out, just uniformly working together. Garcia? Garcia, what did you do? Jenkins asked as he saw the two of them enter the main section. In response, Garcia just grabbed one of the tools Jerkins was using and hit him over the head. Blood poured out from the wound, suspended in the weightless atmosphere in red, small balls. Seeing what was about to happen, Matthews, Riker, and Cameron all pushed themselves towards the two psychotic crew members and did their best to disarm them. The struggle drove them across the ship as Jenkins' blood started hitting the wall. Most of the sensitive electronics were secure, but where the blood managed to enter, a few unimportant systems were destroyed. Garcia was by far the largest of the group, and even in zero gravity, that proved an advantage. But at some point in the fight, Cameron managed to get a kick in, pushing Garcia headfirst into the airlock. Then they pushed Halloway with him and locked it. What the fuck do we do now? Riker asked. Cameron was busy attending to the wounded, unconscious Jenkins. His wound was bleeding profusely, but Cameron quickly applied a makeshift bandage to prevent his blood from covering the walls of the station. Come on, stay with me, she yelled. Once he was deemed stable, Cameron joined the rest of her crew, trying to repair the control movement gyroscope. While the comms were important, the main priority was getting the station away from the void's orbit before collision. The crew spent the next twenty or so hours trying to repair the hopelessly damaged CMGs, but it was a futile task. None of them had known the system as well as Holloway, and with him locked away, there was nothing they could do. Around the twentieth hour, a chunk could be heard coming from inside the airlock. Halloway and Garcia had somehow managed to break a hole in the wall, giving them direct access to the airlock's door mechanics. Despite the psychotic state, they were well aware of the station's systems. Halloway, stop it! Matthews called over the station's speaker system. If you damage the airlock, we're all gonna die! But the two men didn't care. They were so far gone from their former selves that not even the immediate threat of death seemed to worry them. We have to eject them, Riker said. Kill them? Cameron chimed in. We can't! Despite her opposition to the idea, her voice was meek. She was smart enough to know that there wasn't another choice. Either they die, or we all die. At this point, it's not a question of morality, but simple math. Both Cameron and Matthews looked at him in despair. Jenkins wasn't even conscious and able to give input. They just nodded, all of them knowing exactly what had to be done. Halloway, Garcia, either you either stop that shit, or we eject you into space. You're gonna die if you don't stop, Cameron said over the speakers, but her message was ignored. It's time. Let's just get it over with. As the next in command, I'll pull the trigger, Matthew said. Everything had already been prepared. 
All that remained was to input the command that would override the system and kill the crewman. May God forgive me for this. He mumbled to himself as he hit enter. The inner airlock sealed itself while the outer prepared to open. Within a minute, the doors opened and the two men were forcibly pulled into the vacuum of space. There are many misconceptions when it comes to death by the vacuum of space. Contrary to common belief. One does not immediately freeze, nor does your body explode from a sudden change in pressure. Truth be told, death in space is one of the least dignified ways of leaving life. The air would be sucked out from your lungs with a great likelihood of rupturing them in the process as the saliva on your tongue boils. Whatever's still left of your intestines would be equally removed. Within 15 seconds... You'd lose consciousness due to hypoxia. I took solace in that fact as I looked over at the footage that at least the poor astronauts weren't awake to experience their horrible deaths. The crew stayed silent for a few minutes after the ejection. None of them were brave enough to break the silence until Matthews finally realized he was now in charge of the station. The GMCs are done. We need to try to get a message out before the void swallows us, he said with a defeated voice, albeit with a hint of purpose. They only had a few hours until impact, and who knew exactly how large the hole had grown during the past 24 hours? Cameron, how are we doing? Matthews asked after a couple of hours' work. It's not looking good, but I think we might be able to get a simple message through, but we gotta be fast. We're gonna lose in less than an hour, she said back. You want the honor? You're in charge now, after all. So while Cameron and Riker went to check on Jenkins, Matthews went on to send the last living message we'd ever received from the crew. Ground Control. This is Matthews. After we'd listened to the message for the second time, the black void had appeared outside of the window. The crew had gathered, hugging each other as they approached within mere meters of it. This is it, Riker let out in a panicked whisper. Oh, God. With that, every ray of light, artificial or not, vanished from the station. A minute of yells and beeps followed as the crew scrambled to turn the lights back on, but based on everything they said... The systems hadn't gone down. The light was simply being consumed by the void. In many ways, the place acted like a black hole without affecting physical mass in any destructive way. How are we still alive? Riker called out. I don't know. Why aren't the lights working? Is the station dead? Cameron asked. It's not just the station. Look outside, Matthew said with a horrified voice. Outside the window, there was nothing but infinite darkness, rid of any light. There was a strange tinge of blue just barely touching the surface of the station. But where it had come from, no one could say. The weird illumination created eerie outlines inside, allowing the crew to just about move around without hitting the walls. And then, the darkness started to fade, and the lights inside the station slowly came back to life, as if the unseen force had just been removed. Once they secured the inside of the station, they all gathered at the windows and just fell into deafening silence. I can't blame them. Because the world that existed outside in the empty vacuum of space was unlike anything known to mankind. If I hadn't seen the footage myself, I never would have believed it. As the footage played... Our offices received a call from the team running a salvage operation. They could confirm that the wreckage definitely belonged to the GSSS. There were no traces of the astronauts anywhere in the mess. They had not returned with the station. Not knowing what to say, I just redirected my attention back to the still playing footage. Wherever the astronauts had ended up, none of us knew. But one thing was certain. The astronauts were no longer within our realm. 
of reality. They were in a nightmare. Stay the fuck back! We gotta fix the comms. Come on. You have to talk to us. Why did you sabotage the station? Did you see something in the hall? What was that? Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. I just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to tonight's story or watching tonight's video. I appreciate it. As always, I cannot thank you enough for always being here. And if you guys would like to see more or hear more, then I'd appreciate it if you click that subscribe button. Or if you're listening on the podcast, then click the follow button. You guys like words, right? I speak words. You guys hear words. Also, did you know you can read words? They put a lot of words into things called books. And I have two of those on Amazon. Mr. Creepypasta's Creepypasta Collection. Volumes 1 and Volume 2 are available now on Amazon. If you give them a search, or you could just scroll down to the description. And as always, I want to give a big thank you to all you guys who support on Patreon, patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, especially Jacob Schaefer, Jay, Zach, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Ken Landa Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Kraus, Katrina Beasel, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Miss Exandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Eurogore, Suji Campbell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Frickin', Azarine Fox, Robert White, Andreas Garza, Snails Brennan, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Chris Lovin, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Justin Johnson, 1-800 Nightmare, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Jason Wilson, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Plater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Brennan Wright, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiwi the Sloth, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Talon Karlick, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Cordy Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for supporting me, and if you guys would like to join them on the list of people's names I mispronounce, you can always do so at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, as well as all those fine people in the description down below who help support this channel and keep the lights on and give treats to Hylas and Hercules. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I love and appreciate every single one of you who support there or just support anywhere by watching and subbing. So good night, everybody and sweet dreams.